One of the things that came up during our Timcast IRL episode with Mr. Jeff Younger was the concept of surrogacy and surrounding the issue of men's rights. A lot of the stuff starts coming together, along with a bunch of other ideas around artificial wombs, abortion. There's, there's a big conversation here, especially uh, when it comes to surrogacy and men's rights as it pertains to uh, their children. When you go to divorce courts, the court, who, who the courts favor. And uh, I'm trying to just do like a wide spread on all these uh, subjects that we that we've brought uh, we've talked about before. But on today's episode of the Culture War, we're going to be discussing all of these things and what it means for society and where we go. I think there's a big question around the traditional gender roles, the roles of mothers and fathers, and how we navigate what's happening to our society. Last, uh, not last week, but a couple weeks ago, we talked with Fresh and Fit, who uh, ha have basically. They've lamented the modern state of dating, and their solution was more focused on adapting to it and becoming something different as a man. Whereas Jason Howerton, high value dad, said, no, no, you have to resist these things and retain those traditional values that make you a good father. So I think we have a lot to discuss uh, and, and to elaborate on. We have a couple people joining us today. Uh, Katie, would you like to introduce yourself first? Yeah, my name's Katie Faust. I run the children's rights nonprofit Them Before Us, which in insists that adults bend to children's rights rather than insisting that children conform to adult desires. Uh, that makes me a fierce advocate I'm sorry, a fierce adversary of surrogacy in all forms. Um, in essence, children have a right to their mother and father. And we look at every marriage and family issue from the definition of marriage to divorce to same-sex parenting, reproductive technologies, adoption, cohabitation, everything through the lens of the best interest of the child. So that I'm going to be representing what I hope is a very accurate picture of children's interests in this conversation. And we have Jeff Younger. Hi, my name is Jeff Younger. I um, I got embroiled in family law unwillingly when my ex-wife tried to transition my son to a girl and the entire government uh, of the state of Texas basically sided with her and tried to chemically castrate my son at the age of eight. Um, and so that took me down this rabbit hole of exactly what parental rights are, how they're actually uh, understood in the legal system. Um, I would like to say that I think... Um, Katie Faust has a sincere love of children, and I admire a lot of her work. I do disagree with her on surrogacy. Well, let's, uh, we, have, we have a lot to talk about. I want to talk about, uh, obviously, traditional gender roles come into play here, the differences between men and women, men's rights, dating, relationships, all of that <laughs> stuff will be big. But we can just get started with surrogacy in general, because this was uh, a point of contention on, on our episode of IRL when, when you were here. Yes, sir. There are a lot of women who are not even uh, conservative who have a distaste for the idea of surrogacy. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if either of you wants to start. Maybe, you, you uh, Jeff, you could present your argument and how you feel about it. Sure. So uh, you mentioned uh, two possible ways of dealing with the changes in the world, the technological changes in the world. One was to try to maintain um, uh, traditional ways of living, right? <clears throat> I call that cargo cult thinking. It's, it's, a, it's, it's maintaining the forms of traditional life, but without all of the other things that enable it right? Um, there's another approach which says you should just give into it and uh, become a libertine. Uh, and I, I disagree with that as well. If you go onto my, onto my Twitter uh, profile, you'll see that I call myself a paleo futurist. And what I mean by that is, I believe that we should try to take traditional values and project them into an inevitable ultra science future. And the question we should be asking is what values are we trying to hold? Not the forms by which we've held them. What values are we trying to hold and project them into this future? Now, the reason surrogacy ever came up to me is because a whole bunch of my followers, young men, were telling me they were doing this. That they had, most of them, I, in fact, I met with them about a month ago in Austin. I went to an event and they all hooked up with me. I spent a lot of time with one, one fellow who was already going to Argentina and is planning to do this and has already funded it. And almost all of them said to me the same thing. I saw my dad destroyed by my mother in divorce court. And they said it that way. They didn't say it was destroyed by the courts. They said it was destroyed by their mother. Um, and they do not intend to have that happen to them. And they, and they were taken from their fathers forcefully. And so their idea is to have children where they actually have rights. And then they can get married to a woman, but she won't be able to take their children. And I think it's a rational approach to dealing with the risks of marriage in the modern world. That's a horrifying reality. It is. And I've also heard many similar stories. This is why you have... Uh, it's not exactly why you have some of these groups like uh, men go their own way. Yes, yeah. MGTOW, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But did I'm you want to? I'm opposed to MGTOW, by the way. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to? Uh, 
Oh, I want <laughs> to. Ex- ex- uh, elaborate and give yeah. us your view. Absolutely. 100% sympathetic to Jeff's position. He is absolutely correct about how the divorce courts stack the deck against men and against fathers and very often allow the woman to weaponize the courts against men who all they want is to love and be connected to their children. But then they end up paying through the nose for kids they never get to see. And I feel bad for the men, but I'm enraged on behalf of the kids. Enraged. What they are losing, what Jeff's sons have lost is not something that can ever be quantified, not at all. It's a lifelong loss that they are going to, they're gonna experience that wound forever. They're being starved of not just the male love that all children need, but the biological identity that comes from being raised by their own dad. I mean, what the courts have done to Jeff and what they are doing to thousands of other men across this country is criminal. And you see why I love Katie Faust. Well, (laughs) and that is why one of the planks at them before us is to fight no-fault divorce, Mm -hmm. which very, very often hands the most power to the women. No-fault divorce is probably the proximate cause of all this. I agree. Well, so- So, but let's talk surrogacy. Well, uh, actually, I was going to say, as we're introducing these ideas of, uh, you know, what's, why is there even a conversation about surrogacy? Perhaps we should pause and talk about no-fault divorce, which is the legal yeah. change and the social change. We must talk about no-fault divorce. Yeah. And then, you know, surrogacy is very much a technological uh, uh, advance. Mm-hmm. Were, it, were it not possible to do IVF, we wouldn't even be talking about it. Correct. That's right. But before we even get into the science of how society is changing, I think no-fault divorce, we've talked about it quite a bit. I, I think this is a cause of a massive amount of problems and contention today. Yeah. So the way that we talk about it then before us is... Functionally, what children are right now is accessories to be cut and pasted into any and every adult relationship, right? We have an understanding of parental rights to their children, but we don't have an idea of children's rights to their own parents. And those actually go together, right? People care which baby they take home from the hospital. They don't want just any kid in the nursery. They actually want their baby. Mm -hmm. There's something precious and special about taking your own child home. There is something distinct and wonderful about your own progeny. And we can get into adoption later, but... We all, I mean, there was that ridiculous article like last week that was like, wanting your own biological children is, oh, yes. what, what, what was it called? It was a, it was a racist. Or, I know she, equi- she equated it yes. with white supremacy or yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. And that is like all of these arguments. And I think where we're going with your argument, Jeff, is this idea that you're going to be able to overhaul human nature. You, you, no matter how technology changes, no matter how law changes, no matter how culture mm-hmm. changes, you cannot overhaul child nature. Mm-hmm. And children have a natural right to be known and loved by both of their biological parents. Mm -hmm. Those two adults grant children statistically the safest home that they're going to experience. Like if your Mm -hmm. wife remarries, the man that joins her life will never be as statistically connected to, invested in, and protective Mm -hmm. of your sons be as one of you the are. Threats to him, That's correct. Yeah. This is right. Not only will he not be as connected and invested, he will statistically be one of the most dangerous people in That's their right. life. Okay, so we have to get very clear about children having a right to their own mother and father. Um, the threats that have disconnected children from that are cultural, legal, and technological. So we, we'll be talking about one of the technological shifts that have commodified children and turned them into functional accessories. But the legal shifts have also been at play since the late 60s, and Mm -hmm. it began with no-fault divorce. No-fault divorce was the first, in essence, redefinition of the family. It transformed what used to be the most child-friendly institution the world has ever known, marriage, into just another vehicle of adult fulfillment. It said, we used to have this idea that marriage was going to be permanent, and the only time you would break it up is if one spouse was found to be at fault of Mm -hmm. abuse, adultery, abandonment, addiction, but we turn to no-fault divorce. Mm -hmm. And since women have sort of higher rates of um, emotional expectation, they tend to be dissatisfied more quickly Mm -hmm. in the marriage. And when you can get out of it for no fault, they get out of it sooner. So that was the original redefinition of marriage. And legally, what put all of this in place when it comes to treating children as accessories? No, no no-fault divorce is just the end of marriage. Marriage does not exist. That's right. There's uh, uh, people have mentioned Covenant marriage, I think it's mm-hmm. called in like Alabama. I'm not sure what other states mm-hmm. have it. And this is them trying to recodify what actual marriage is. Yeah. But there is, you know, quite literally, if you enter into a spiritual, moral and legal contract till death do us part, but the legal has been completely removed mm-hmm. and the moral foundations of society have become dissociative or fractured, yes. then you quite literally are just dating. 
Right. You know, we, we've mm -hmm. seen these fling marriages for a year or two. You see all these celebrities, they're married mm -hmm. for five years and then, they're, and then they, they're, they're, they're broken up. That's not marriage. Right. It is not marriage. And this gives me the opportunity. I, I, I really think productive discussions start from what the Greeks used to call stasis, where people agree. For real. Because we, then we can reason out from where we agree and try to achieve clarity where we disagree and maybe even overcome those disagreements. Jeff and I right? agree on a lot. I oh, think. yeah. I don't disagree actually with anything she said. That may surprise you. I think the the intact nuclear family with one mother and one one father is the is the best thing for children, objectively the best thing. It's also the most enduring institution in human history. It actually predates history. Correct. It goes back before written history. This is right. It's the most enduring institution, the most successful institution ever. So I'm all in favor of that. I am concerned with notions of children's rights. Uh, we can talk about why that is. We can. Um, uh, but one of the fundamental things that we lost, and I think we lost it with the Enlightenment, but it really showed up in the American conception of rights. People have come to think of rights as floating abstractions, right? But all rights come with concomitant duties. That's right. Mm -hmm. To me, uh, children's rights are the prudent exercise of parental rights, mm -hmm. right? We have to be careful with the child's best interest too, because um, courts have misused that, as you know. That's right. And there's there's no real objective uh, child's best interest for everything. There are are some objective things, like for example, having a mother and a father. I am, on the other hand, not an idealist. Uh, I am dealing with the world as it actually is today, with the political situation as it actually is today, <clears throat> where over half of children are being raised in single mother homes. And in that world, men have to be very serious about protecting themselves before they have children or before they get married. This is interesting because uh, you mentioned uh, someone going to Argent, I think you said Argentina. Yes. Fresh and Fit talked about something called passport bros. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. These are guys who know they can't or who believe they cannot find a wife mm -hmm. in the United States because mm -hmm. of the culture, uh, uh, the moral frameworks this country has. Mm -hmm. So they go to other countries with traditional values, but also a lower standard of living. Yeah. So they're viewed more favorably, mm -hmm. like uh, yes. they mentioned going to the Philippines, right. yeah. where the, the, the standard of living is, is low. So you have these young women who see an American come here. They're wealthy. They have access. And that is attractive to them. And they, so you're going to end up with a wife who is more committed and actually more worried about the relationship breaking apart. Whereas in America, you have the, the feminist, you know, more woke vision where women can have it all, do what they want and leave whenever they want. And courts will favor them if they do. Yeah. So there's a lot of work to be done, but the answer cannot be whatever work needs to be done in culture, in law and in technology. And there is a lot to be done. The answer cannot be a kid is going to sacrifice for me. I understand the system is broken. I understand the technology is advancing way beyond our ethical conversations, but the solution can never be this kid sacrifices so I can have what they want. And ultimately that's what surrogacy does in a hundred percent of cases. I don't actually believe the sacrifice of a single father home is equivalent to the sacrifice of a single mother home. Single father homes have outcomes which are much better than single mother homes, and it's substantially close to two parent homes, so they're not not as good. Hmm. And I'd it's like certainly to see not that. more. Is that not, in the brief that you gave me? It is not in. It's not in these two, but I can get you one. Okay. I can get you two actually. We, two. So I know that there's a few studies, but are you? But what studies do you have that show outcomes for children who were motherless at birth? So th there's two uh, studies. One of them has a subpopulation study. So for example, it does find that there's like less criminality, higher college attainment, uh, less suicidality. Equivalent so to the two parent married biological parents? No, no. Between mm -hmm. single single mother homes and Versus single, single father, father homes. Versus single father. Sure. Right. Okay. I, and I can and see then that. the subpopulation study here, which you may, well, I have to be honest, like subpopulation studies are less conclusive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the subpopulation studies, they say, well, of these single father homes, which ones were from illness? Mm -hmm. Right, deaths like that, and accidental right. deaths, mm, and they find the same effects. The effects are similar, although it's not conclusive. You're saying similar between the child whose mother died versus the child whose mother left through divorce. Yes. Okay. On single father homes, and this echoes actually. I'm a, I'm Orthodox. The Greek Orthodox Church did a longitudinal study of church attendance for uh, children who go to college into these sort of communist, uh, atheist, communist factories, and how many continue to attend uh, church. And the only thing that correlated with church attendance was whether the father brought them. Oh, that's why you men know, need to be, need to be yeah. the head of the home and the head of the church. Well, so so uh, this, is, this is an interesting point. You say that uh, the study, I, I guess what you're saying is that 
single single parent fa- uh, with, with a father yes have be- s- s- better outcomes. better outcomes but i wonder if it's better. just then single mother parented homes not better outcomes right, right, no. than married mother of father. course right but i'm wondering if Nothing's we're, we're not mother. tracking right. the detriments of not having a mom so here's the thing people will say to me because mm-hmm. i fight surrogacy at every front in every way traditional uh, mm-hmm. traditional gestational altruistic commercial i don't care it is always the intentional loss of a child's mother on the day that they are born and we can i'll give you the children's rights mm-hmm. framework if you want but you know people will say well we have lots of data Jordan Peterson and Dave Rubin had this conversation, you know, where they said, oh, there's so much data about the harms of father loss, but there's not a lot about mother loss. There's not a lot of studies about what happens when a child grows up motherless. And the question is why? Why do you think that is, Tim? Well, I want to just clarify the point. When you're looking at a study and you say, let's look at drug abuse, college Mm -hmm. attainment, crime, and you're like, hey, look, if a child has just a dad, they tend to do better than if they have just a mom. Correct. But what aren't we tracking between yes. a child who has both parents and a child who doesn't have a mom? Mm-hmm. If, if, if uh, in our minds- And I would say, why is it even harder to find the kids with raised only by a single dad? Because those, those households are harder to find. And they when you're are. talking about good studies, you can't just be like, hey, single dads, come volunteer for this. You have to find them at random. They are hard to find at random because there's not a lot of them. And my question is why? Well, there's so, another so weakness I, I, too, I'll tell you about. There's another weakness in those studies, in my studies I'm talking about. Yeah. But just my immediate assumption is- and I mean this is no, no disrespect. I mean, if we're looking at uh, yeah. uh, children who grow up without fathers, they have a higher rate of criminality, lower rate of right. you know school mm-hmm. uh, 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 finishing school. Right. I'd imagine that a child who grew up without a mother probably has emotional issues. We're not tracking. So correct. Could be. I think that's yeah. And and we don't we don't look at the t- statistics of you know is someone more prone to anger or more detached or mm-hmm. callous. Mm-hmm. We have no reason to look into these things. Or f- relationship formation. Right. right. Attachment, bonding, mm-hmm. trust, mm-hmm. Um, levels of sensitivity yep. to one another, Empathy. ability to form yep. formations. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm parenting a child who did not have any parents, had no mother for the first two years of his life. It is very, very difficult for kids. Well, we can talk about the distinctiveness of mothering if, if you want, but I want to get back to this question of why is it that we have endless studies on the impact of father loss in children and fatherlessness, but we have very, very few on mother loss. Patriarchy. Oh, oh it's the patriarchy. <laughs> it's the patriarchy. No, and it's- I'm, I'm, I'm only half, half kidding. Okay. Our pers- perspective on society, these studies is quite literally the like detriment in the immediate. Mm-hmm. Crime is something we have to deal with and solve. Mm-hmm. But if someone's got emotional issues, we just say, oh, that dude's got and an hard to measure. problem. Let's that, be honest. That's right. hard to measure. That's right. So measure. I'm going to give you the answer. The reason why we don't have studies um, longitudinal done where you can find the kids at random, database populations, um, adequate control groups, why don't we have those? Because mother loss is so foreign to our species. Mm. What happens when a child is created? Uh, Both a man and woman have to be there at the moment of conception. Biology requires about an average three to five minute contribution from the guy. Okay. (laughs) What does it require of the woman? Is that really the average? It's the average. I hope not. <laughs> it's the average. Uh, what does it require of the woman? It insists that she's there for the first nine and a half months. Yeah. She can't leave. The baby can't leave. And then afterwards- well, Hold on, hold on. Yes. Just to, just to interject. Okay. Removing technology from the equation, the mother is required to be there for a substantially longer amount of time after the nine months. Right. Yes. And do you know what? So not only is she literally mm-hmm. connected to the child- be- uh, there's no other person in our existence, unless you become a mother yourself, where you are connected by a literal cord. That's how connected mother and baby are. Mm-hmm. Now, before we had technology, before we had bottles, or if you didn't have a wet nurse, the mom died, the baby died. Yeah. Our species does not have a lot of experience with motherless babies because babies cannot live without mothers. I don't mothers. agree with this. Well, so and perhaps now the, the answer is inducing lactation in men so the men can- <laughs> Well, Tim, the people are doing that it. does solve everything, doesn't it? <laughs> But I'll continue. Look, no, uh, 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 prior to modern medical technology, uh, uh, female uh, death rates in birth, birthing were very high. Right. Actually, our species is well adapted to mother loss, and it has been with us for a long time. Um, that doesn't mean, however, I'm not stretching this to mean that the problems that we're talking about of motherless not being well studied, I think the real reason is that motherless, motherlessness is just comparatively much more rare. That's in right. In modern society, and you 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 have a hard time even getting study groups to do it. It's so right, because, our main social problem is father loss, right. and that's why. Well, because biology, again, 
women are working within a chemical system. Once the baby is born, during pregnancy and childbirth especially, and then especially once mm -hmm. you start breastfeeding, there is oxytocin spikes in the woman that literally will chemically bond her to the baby. The baby is bonded mm -hmm. to her. And that happens it's, on the regular for the first couple years of a child's it's even life. even deeper than that. I'll, I'll give you an example from my own children's birth. So uh, you know that I used IVF. I do. Right? So my children are not genetically related to my ex-wife. Okay? So they're only genetically related to me. And this is this is the son that you were having? Both the, of them. Both, both of them. The legal issue. Both of them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So... Uh, when Jude was born, uh, he he would have died without uh, modern medical mm -hmm. intervention, and he came out very traumatized. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, you know, I was the first one to hold him, um, and he went straight to the NICU, and he was dying, um, oh, straight up dying. Um, so they they have this thing where they often have the mother come into the NICU and uh, NICU and touch the child, mm -hmm. and the mere touch of the mother can cause a healing response right. in the child. Wow. So not knowing that we had used IVF, they asked my ex-wife to go in and, and, and do this, and it had no effect. Wow. And then when they found out IVF was used, they called me in there, and I just put my hand on my, and I'll, I'll, never, for, I'll never forget this. My son was dying, and I touched his back, and I put my hand on his back, and in five minutes, mm -hmm. he went to normal. Mm -hmm. Wow. That he needed you then, he needs you now. And it's a yeah, crime. It's a crime subject. that he's not with you. Well, so this brings up the question about surrogacy and IVF. Yeah. I mean, there's... there's. I, I, See, I, I don't dispute any of this. Mm -hmm. This is not what, what I'm talking about with surrogacy. So you can... I think your argument's probably going to be very effective from a men's right position. It's, it's not going to be effective from a children's rights position. Yeah, I don't even take the men's rights position. Mm -hmm. position. Um, what what I what I claim is that I'm I'm actually just claiming this on a basic social level mm -hmm. that we are going to destroy the lives of half the men that get married mm -hmm. and the children mm -hmm. in those marriages, right? And I think we will have far less social damage if we have a nation of single fathers than single mothers. Mm -hmm. And I and I'm I'm what I'm doing is not comparing against the ideal sure. which we agree on. Right. And and I love you for for. for promoting this idea, mm -hmm. deal, right? I mean, I, I firmly agree with you on it. I'm saying in the real world where we exist today, in the legal framework, this horrifying legal framework that governs marriage, the way we reduce damage the most is to prevent fathers' lives from being destroyed so that they can be with their kids. I My view is, you know, I, I can certainly agree with a lot of what you're saying. Yeah, it's we, really not we, a men's rights issue. We need to make sure there's a, a balance between, you know, uh, fathers and, and and mothers in and the rights of the children we, yeah. we want to keep the families together yeah but i i don't necessarily agree i understand that the data we have so far shows mm -hmm. that in mm -hmm. in the immediate the things we care about the most without a father crime mm -hmm. etc yes but I, I i have to say i think if 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 it, and if you have a society where there is a disproportionate amount of motherless children, yes. you are going to have a dysfunctional society that in, 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 in some other way. Well, I think it's only necessary for my argument that it be no worse than the current society. Mm. Right. We can right. avoid destroying half of the men who get married. And so my argument only requires that it be no worse. And I claim that it is no worse. So let me break down what surrogacy is from the yeah. children's rights perspective. What surrogacy is at its core is the trifurcation of the mother. Okay, there are three different components of the mother that surrogacy in essence splices and gives you purchasable and optional choices about the woman involved. So the three different women that you're splitting up in surrogacy is the genetic mother, that's the woman mm -hmm. who contributes the egg. Right. Um, and that is the one that grants children their biological identity. When kids go that's to bed right. at night and try to figure out like, who am I? Where did I get my hair? What's my mm -hmm. ethnicity? Does my mother know who I am? Does she think about me? Do I have half siblings? They're thinking about their genetic mother. The woman who the big fertility world will say, oh, she's just a donor. You can go right now and Google egg donor catalog and you can filter the results for your child's genetic mother based on hair color, mm -hmm. Ivy League education, all of that. I mean, you're, you're shopping for your child's mother. Sperm donors too. Same with sperm yeah. donation, right? And so the egg donor is the first mother. And then the second mother is the birth mother, okay? Mm -hmm. And the big surrogacy people will just pitch this as, well, she's not a mother, right? It's, it's, she's just an oven for somebody else's bun. But the reality is that 
that is the only relationship that the child has at the moment they are born. Yeah. They don't know that they're not genetically related to the person giving birth to them. Your kids didn't know that your wife was mm -hmm. not their genetic mother. Right. But that's her body, her voice, her smell, her milk. That's mm -hmm. who she that's what they wanted, mm -hmm. right? And that is the foundation for trust and attachment in a child's life. So, for example, we have almost 60 years of experience with infant adoption and largely children who have been adopted as infants are adopted into homes that are have more stable marriages, where the people are more wealthy, more highly educated, mm -hmm. and statistically even spend more time with kids than the average biological parent. And yet, adoptees do not fare as well. They struggle more in mm -hmm. school. They have more challenges yep. with trust and attachment, identity issues. <clears throat> um, it this and, and adoptees call that a primal wound. They were wounded at the most primal stages of their development because they were cut off from the first and only relationship that they had and they had to start over. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's the birth mother. And then the social mother is the woman that provides that female specific love for the kid. And men cannot do that. Uh, men do not do that. And here's a few examples. Um, you know, women have a lower tolerance for children's cries, right? We hear a baby crying. This happened to me at the airport. There was a baby crying and I was like, God, get the baby. Why are you letting the baby cry? And I just wanted to get up and be like, give me the baby. Men are like, she'll be okay. Here's a few Cheerios. And it's okay to have those different styles. But when babies are in distress, they're wet, they're tired, they're hungry, their cortisol levels rise. They cannot drop their own cortisol levels. They are literally incapable. Uh, Erica Komazar would say they don't have a central nervous system at this point. The only way for their stress levels to drop is for their oxytocin to increase. They can't express their own oxytocin. Only skin-to-skin -skin contact will do that. And only That's mothers right. exactly have the right. level of responsiveness that will constantly bring down their cortisol levels dozens and dozens of times every day and thereby establish that ability to emotionally regulate. So I, here's the thing. Surrogacy breaks women up into genetic mother, birth mother, and mm -hmm. social mother. Mm -hmm. None of these women are optional in the life of the child. Mm -hmm. And if they are not found in one woman, that kid is going to experience loss. I just want to highlight I one agree thing. agree with all that. I agree with all the negatives that she said about surrogacy. So I just want to highlight one thing real quick because this is something I had read about quite a bit throughout my life. Mm -hmm. I just did a quick Google search. The West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources says, babies who are deprived of touch can fail to thrive, lose weight, and even die. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what what I've been told, what I've read, you know, and that's not something I follow but you know, 10 years ago, I'm reading articles on this stuff, yeah. that if a baby is without touch from the mother, it literally just dies. That's right. That's crazy. Let I mean, me, and the story you told, Jeff, there's something, I don't know there's if you call legit it- about it. No, Spiritual I agree, or again, divine or something. Again, I agree with everything you're saying. We're, I, it's, we don't really dis dispute the facts here. We're not disputing Well, it, it, it sounds like then if, if we recognize it is a detriment mm -hmm. that uh, we go through IVF and surrogacy because of what the mm -hmm. legal system is doing, and it seems like the solution should be to change the culture and the legal system. Yes. That's correct. So here's, but here's where we get into the sticky area of policy, right? Um, I never speak about social problems in terms of solutions, right? These problems have been with us. Look, infanticide and uh, giving babies away uh, were existing. How, how do you find, you know how you find Roman brothels when archaeologists find mm. Roman brothels? The bones of the dead children. The bones back. of dead boys. Boys, Whoa. that's right. That's they right. find dead, because they kill all the male babies, they're of no economic use. Mm -hmm. They raise girl children up to be prostitutes in right. these brothels. Oh. So that's how they find them, okay? Mm -hmm. So like, this is an ancient problem. It's, it's never going away from us, but we should think in terms of mitigating these problems and minimizing them. And that's a better way of thinking about them, I think. So I don't ever talk in terms of solutions. The, the solution is, I believe, ending no-fault divorce, mm -hmm. right? Completely ending no-fault divorce. And I would be even willing to compromise because we live in a world, a democracy, where we have to, I would compromise and say, you may have no-fault divorce if there are no children in the mm -hmm. marriage. If there are children in the marriage, it converts to a no-fault oh, divorce. I like that. Yeah. And now we have created a, a way for people to- You, you mean it converts off of no-fault divorce? Uh, uh, you, you would you, have to go to an at-fault model at that yeah, point. Yeah, you go to an at-fault model yeah. when you have children. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. So, and I, I'm willing to compromise with people who want these these sort of what I call emotional marriages. You know, I'm willing, okay, fine, let's do that. I think we can have to do some other things with, um, you know, correcting some, the legal system around domestic violence and some other stuff. There are legal ways to do this. I'm just telling you that you're fighting because of Title IV-D reimbursements to the states, which are heavily invested in divorce and only exist when fathers are out of the home. 
just like the welfare system destroyed the black families in this country, when these systems are so big, I mean, you're talking about trillions of dollars. These are bigger than some of the largest defense programs. Jeff is programs. the first one that educated me on this reality. Yeah. He really knows this. Yeah, this they're, they're larger than some of the largest defense programs. And wow. we can't get rid of these defense programs. Mm -hmm. The Marine Corps and the Army have been trying to get rid of the heavy division concept since the 1980s when I was in the military, and they can't get rid of it. So my problem is it's going to take five generations to, get, here, to alter these laws. What do we do about men in the meantime? Here's the issue with converting to an at-fault divorce upon, uh, first it would have to be upon conception. Yes. But then you run into the problem of people who aren't married, who conceive. Yes. Do we then say the moment there is a conception between a man and a woman, you are now in an, an at-fault marriage or an at-fault divorce system. You are married now. Mm. The other issue is. Yeah, uh, yes. Then, but how do you prove the baby is is the man's? If the, if, genetic testing. But if the woman is only a few weeks pregnant, she's not far along enough to actually do the genetic Amniocentesis testing. Amniocentesis can do that. At any time. Yes. You know, it, well, there this you go, is, I guess. This but that's, it, it does seem kind of brutal and invasive that, uh, could, to, be, you, to be fair, I mean, if a dude we, we, impregnates a woman, he he should not when, be allowed to When we get into leave. the details of laws, we could, we could, again, I would compromise and say, okay, um, you, you become a prospective no fault a marriage a partner until the birth of the child when it's genetically tested. Mm -hmm. We could do that. I'm fine with that. Well, but the problem there is- My point the, is- The, the, test, the yeah. testing would have to be, we have seen stories, there was one story, I think it was mm -hmm. out, of, out of Wisconsin, where a yeah. woman got pregnant. When she gave birth, she listed some random guy she knew as the father. Mm -hmm. I think it was Wisconsin. And then the guy was like, what? I'm not the father. Got a genetic test, yes. proved that he wasn't. And the judge said, don't know, don't care. The baby needs a dad. So you are now on the hook for well, it. Well, that, that is not, uh, that's insane. an aberration. Right. That's oh, an aberration. actually, I'm sorry. You need to, you all need to look up Carnell West, um, who started the movement against this. But um, until, I can tell you this in Texas, until 2014, all children in the marriage were presumed to be the husbands. And that's actually how it should be. That's actually why. What about it's when the woman has an affair? It's called a presumption of parenthood. What about when she has an affair? Well, so then you can, you need to presume. The mm -hmm, presumption mm -hmm. is correct. You yeah. should presume that the yeah. children born to a marriage are yep. the genetic offspring. If there's a problem, that's the exception. Deal with the exception. I don't yeah, think that he should be responsible for the, a child, but the, the presumption is correct. The problem is that, well, we used to do that, like for all of, almost all of Western law, right. we presume this, right? Right. Um, but the, the issue comes when, you know, what are the conditions under which you can demonstrate that the child isn't yours and be relieved of your obligations, right? Most states did not have a way to do that until just the last six years. Hmm. You know, Carnell, Carnell uh, for example, I've talked to him at length about this. I mean, he paid child support for 15 years for a child that wasn't his, and they just wouldn't stop, stop even wow. though he had genetic tests. Wow. wow. Texas never allowed genetic tests until I think it was 2014. That's too bad. California says that uh, fathers may never genetically test their children without the consent of the mother, so they're allowed to hide it. Yeah. Wow. So like, I agree that we have got to overhaul the system so that okay, there are good. advantages financially, socially, yeah. for men to commit to the women that they're making babies with. And yeah, it's good for men and women, but it's non-negotiable for the babies. Like yeah. I, if from a children's rights perspective, we have got to start changing so, culture, law, and technology so kids have so both. It comes, this is where it comes down to. Like, I'll be, I, Look, I'm with you. I'll tell you how much I'm with you. Even after my ex-wife tried to transition my son, for five years, I till, still told her I'd remarry her and raise our kids. I, can we Even just Even though I, I have a total disagreement with her about that. But it's that important. I believe it, right? Yeah. My point is that are we going to compare uh, what men should do against an ideal that doesn't exist and won't exist for decades? Or should, what do we tell men in the meantime? Culture, law, and technology don't My, reflect the ideal. Mm -hmm. That is true. Mm -hmm. The answer is not to remake children in your own technological mm -hmm. image. It's that is not Argentina. the solution. It is. I, you I, can go to Argentina. You can marry a woman. Just make sure that you raise your kids with the woman that is their well, mother. Well, there's actually a Christian way to actually do surrogacy in a way. No, there's so you, not. So you have legal surrogacy, but you don't actually use somebody else's egg. So for example, I, I've checked in three states and there's nothing that prevents a married woman from entering a surrogacy contract. So you could get married, uh, you have your wife sign a surrogacy contract, and then you have conjugal relations in a biblical way, and then the children belong to the father and the mother has the legal relation of a stepmother. Interesting, but she's the, still the biological mother in every yes. way. And that's that's and, horrifying. And as yeah, a, that's what that no, is. No, no, it, it, oh, but, hold, but wait, I, wait, 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 wait,
Because because every woman I've talked to says this. Because the biological mother, the birth mother, mm-hmm. the social mother should all also be the legal mother. You do mm-hmm. not splice woman into three different parts, the social, the legal, and the genetic. Mm-hmm. From a children's rights perspective, all of those women need to be found in one place. And just like it was an injustice to strip you of your Mm -hmm. rights to your children, even though you're the biological father, it's an injustice to strip children of their mothers. Would you marry under such a condition? Would you marry under those conditions? If a man said, hey, I want you to sign a surrogacy contract so the children are mine in a patriarchal and biblical sense, they, they belong to me. Would you bury, marry and have a child under those conditions? I married and had a child with a man who 100% gets 100% claim to my children. And I don't need Not legally. to do it. You have, the, you have the claim to the children. No, we both have a claim to the children. If do I were you, to divorce you, him, there's a possibility the courts would yes, side with me. They probably but no, would. I, right now. No, hold on, Tim. I'm going somewhere with this. Do you think most women would, would do that? or you think I think precisely zero women would sign such a I agree. What this tells me is that when we put women in the same conditions that fathers are in today, they choose not to have children and not to marry, which proves my point that under the current conditions, surrogacy is a legitimate option. I was going to say that uh, your your statement about legal surrogacy to the biological mother is very logic logically sound and very emotionally horrifying. Yes, it is. <laughs> and and so imagine how fathers feel when they are, when, when no offense, but trad, trad women mm-hmm. are constantly telling young men to just suck it up, take the risk, and marry, when we all admit that this is precisely zero women would do that under the same conditions. Because this, this stepmother in this scenario, being a, being a constant caregiver to the child, would have the same visitation rights as fathers have today. They would have continuous visitation, continuous relationship. The courts would respect that. I understand. I understand that- Women a, won't do it. Why should men? I, I understand that it's risky, and it's the deck is stacked against them. I'm not seeing any man who is- living a happier, better life than the men who are married stably to the women and the mothers no, of their I, children. Yeah, I, but, but, I and, agree. And that, and that is something to strive for and is ideal, but the, like I think Jeff is correct, the, the risks are there for men. Right. And we end up seeing this reflected in a lot of online communities. Yes, yes uh, a that's lot, right. A lot of men are outright saying, I mean, with, with MGTOW, yes. no, it's not, MGTOW's not absolutely about any one thing. There's mm-hmm. a bunch of different issues, but yeah. a lot of these men are saying the risks are too great. Just and, and Jeff makes a great point. Just like a woman would say, I'm not going to enter into that agreement. Mm-hmm. Men literally are saying that. I know. I've read them. I've talked to them. And, but what's oh. disturbing is, you know, you find it horrifying. I find it horrifying. I mean, it's a thought experiment. I'm not something. It's a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, people think I'm proposing. They're thought experiments. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a thought it's experiment. A well, and, and it's sh- effective and it sh- to point out yeah. the problems. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Donald. It's so it's. I'm here for you. No, no. It's like, it's very hard. It's, well, no. Women are rightly upset about me even proposing that. <laughs> but that is the exact position every father is in legally, not mm-hmm. not necessarily socially, but legally in a, in before when they when they have children with a woman in a normal marriage under this horrifying legal regime. And if women won't again I ask, if women won't do it, well how can we how can we ethically tell young men to do it? I don't think we can. Okay, can I ask a question that I wanted I just to don't ask the can. very second that Jeff walked in? I want to know how you're doing. Oh wow. So um so, you know, uh, and, and I, I asked that for two reasons. Number one, yeah, I, this is so nice. I, this is why I love her. Well, I, I, <laughs> I love her. have mourned with you. I've prayed for you, especially you leading have, up to have. this conversation. Yeah, yeah. But I actually think that it would be helpful for everybody listening to understand how this has impacted you and the depths of, of, pain that you've experienced. Yeah. So I just want to hear if you're willing to share, how are you doing? And I'll try to do it in terms of women can understand, right? So, um, cause I think men understand it intuitively. It's hard for women to understand what men feel yes, in these scenarios. Th- that's why I'm asking. And you care about that stuff, uh, which makes you special. Um, so I've, I've described it this way. Um, during the, the trial, um, I was being hyper scrutinized for violent behavior or any, you know, I, it, in court, I would, I would have judges uh, bring bailiffs in um, if I moved too aggressively to grab what a pen or hell? something, right? Well, no, they've, they've completely pathologized all masculine behaviors. Yeah. So, um, and I, I'm kind of big and I'm a bot, they know I'm a boxer and all stuff. So that, you know, they're, they're on edge about it. So I had to sit there calmly and be totally calm and, and have no emotional response as I'm literally watching my son be sexually abused right in front of me. That's what was required of me to save my sons. I accomplished that. So in 2019, I got 50-50 custody, no child support. Yeah. Right on? So uh, they they recused my judge, the Dallas County Democrat judges, in a corrupt proceeding, got rid of my judge, put me in a non-random jury, uh, judge assignment, 
put me in the 301st district co district court with judge bloody mary brown i name names for people and judge bloody mary brown systematically stripped me of all my parental rights she was an activist yeah and she let my son uh moved uh, let my ex-wife move my son to california right after they passed the transgender kidnapping yeah. laws so now i'm i have to remain super calm because california has draconian uh domestic violence because laws. the previous agreement said she cannot do anything medically to him without Correct. your consent but now that she's in california yes. she can do whatever she wants and that was a jury verdict wow. that was yeah. nullified by a judge so wow. um so have you yes. seen them do you do you talk to them so um i did two supervised visits with them um and um you know as soon as I sat down on the couch, they just like laid on me and just jumped. Just that, it's that touch. To and when was that? That, want. Um, that was about three months ago. Oh, I'm glad and that's that the you... only contact I've had in two years. Um, so now I've had to move to California. I went all the way up to the Texas Supreme Court, and the Texas Supreme Court, listen to this, said that my sons were no more at risk to, of being chemically castrated in California under the transgender kidnapping laws than they were in Texas, where it's illegal. What the hell? Wow. Yeah. So what we have is a politicized court. What's happening is the state courts are beginning to collude to <coughs> allow children to migrate to trans friendly states. So I've established a residence in California and I've officially moved there. I'm preparing my house in Texas to rent out and I've moved. You have to be careful. I moved about 30 minutes away from my boys and I'm going to fight in the California courts to have visitation. And I'm also intend to go into the federal courts and challenge the uh, the the laws, the kidnapping law, plus the law that strips parents of their rights if they don't affirm their child. I want to just do, say one thing because I think some people don't understand. MGTOW means men going their own way. Yes. Online communities where men talk about, mm -hmm. you know, they'll post memes of like a guy sitting on a cliffside with his dog, and it'll say yeah. something like yes. "Serenity" or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I, I will also add, you moving to California, sir, is the political equivalent of running into a burning building. You are correct. Yeah, so I, I, we have to talk about getting away from cities and getting away from these jurisdictions if you can, and that we understand some people may want to stay in these in these places um, because of their kids. Yeah, and uh, a lot of people have said I can't move out of the city. You know, I got divorced. My kids are still. Yeah. What am I supposed to do? And I'm like, that I view as your house is on fire and you refuse to leave until you know your children. Hundred percent agree. I also want to point out that what Jeff is doing is the essence of true manhood and the best kind of father. Um, the best the best that fathers can be, which is utter protectiveness and everything you can in terms of provision despite everything being against you. And there really is something distinct. Uh, I would say that it is a genetic biological drive that yes. good men have. Um, and this every is, kid, every child should have a father like this. This is the pain men feel. So, uh, you know, f feminists have often said men don't participate in child rearing equally, all this. So that's not true. That's actually. not true. Uh, really, until the 1950s, nobody was rich enough to do that, mm -hmm. right? Throughout all of human history, women raised young children you, in most, most civilizations at the age of nine. The reputation that the Italians had for being mama's boys because it was till 12, you know, that's where <laughs> that comes from. Mm -hmm. They stayed with their mother. And then the boys went, went with the fathers. And so girls and young children stayed with the mothers. Men have always equally participated in child rearing. And what men feel particularly is this horrifying thing where your offspring are going to be raised in values contrary to your ancestors mm -hmm. and to your own values. Mm -hmm. And your, your children will be turned against your own values. I have a friend in Houston whose wife divorced him and converted his children to Islam. And he's a devout Christian. Mm -hmm. His his children have been turned against his values. You know, this is what men fear mm -hmm. tremendously. It's, well, it's not this, just physical provision. This is what divorce enables. You know, there yeah. was a study done um, by a, a researcher named Elizabeth Margaret, who, who her study was called Between mm -hmm. Two Worlds. And it studied the impact that divorce had on children. And in close to 50% of cases, yeah. the child develop two different personalities mm, because yeah, they had like thing. mom had one political persuasion you know mom's a republican dad's a democrat yeah. mom's a buddhist dad's a republican yeah. or you know a christian you know the, the screen limits over here are like one hour a day there's unlimited screens over here dessert like this diet like this you my, know my son was cauliflower a crust example. over here yes and like they kids have to transform to be a different person between dad house and mom's house and actually your situation was almost archetypal where your child had to literally become a different person yeah. at mom's house girl and dad's at mom's house. house boy that's at dad's exactly house. right. And yeah, that he is never what presented a split as a girl to me. To he never presented right. as a girl to me. Yeah, right. I, I remember seeing the videos. Yeah. Yeah. Where, 
You know, yeah. you're, you're asking your son, and he's like, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah, no. you cannot split your child into two different homes. They develop two different lives yeah, and two yeah, different personalities. Yeah. Wow. That's why I'm cool. I, I'm, I agree with you. I mean, I'm fine with forcing parents simply to stay together and raise their kids to their 18. I'm sorry. You mm-hmm. just got to do what you got to yep. do. Yeah, and I and I, I agree, and I think that if, uh, that's the laws I would like to see. Mm-hmm. If so, the old Roman th- this, laws around marriage. This is the interesting thing about the rights of the child. Uh, if the parents are fighting and it's bad, not to the point of abuse, but screaming, mm-hmm. I think they should be reprimanded by the court, saying like, "You are obligated to stop, well, and and you have to tone it down because this is for the kids." Yeah. So we don't want children growing, growing up in an environment where parents are just screaming at each other twenty four seven. Yeah. And so the, the but you punish is, the parents for that, not the exact, kids. That, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. You're so, hired, dude. You're totally hired. Thing. Here's here's an interesting thing about the, the rights of, of children, right? We often hear from uh, the modern day left establishment narratives yeah. that children have a right to just insert and you name it. Yeah, to a pri- having their transgender identity hidden from yes. their parents. They have a right to testosterone from Planned Parenthood. But my view is it's more so a, a, a right to your parents acting responsibly to Bingo. protect you. Okay, that's, that's where right. I agree. Meaning the child can't decide he wants to eat ice cream. Yeah. That that It is a violation of the rights of the child for a parent to just give them three gallons of ice cream for, yes. for yes. breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yes, okay. it is. So here's the thing. Like I have a children's rights nonprofit, and yes. that is the right word for it. The, the reality is that children's right to their own mother and father, it actually might be too weak of a term. They have mm-hmm. such a claim to their own parents that there mm-hmm. really is very little language we could use to describe the strength of that claim. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I understand that rights it's is the most disputed. fundamental human thing. It is like literally one of the most universal all human, human law and all human yes. civilization is based on that one thing. That's right. And so children have a right to be known and loved by their mother and father. They have a right to life. They have a right to yeah. an intact body, an yeah. unmedicalized body. Yeah. They have a right to innocence. It is the duty of parents to mm-hmm. protect those rights. I love that you're talking about duties. Well, they, they go together. In natural law theory, rights and duties are mm-hmm. two sides of the same That's coin. Correct. Okay. So you're exactly right, Tim, that I, there's a lot of momentum on the right when it comes to parental rights, and that's good. But parental rights has limits. You do not have a right to chemically sterilize your child no. just because you think, I'm nope. the parent, I can do what I want. Nope. So I think parental rights are important, but insufficient when it comes to child protection. Mm -hmm. That is why I use the language of children's rights. Because just because an adult wants to do something like take their kid to drag queen story hour, you don't have a parental right to corrupt your child's mind through these sexualizing programs. I I, I just want to point out what really bothers me is that it is a crime in, Mm -hmm. I I don't know if I can say most, Mm -hmm. but I can tell you that in many jurisdictions, because I've actually looked up the laws, it is outright illegal to bring a child to a drag show yes and the police just don't do anything they about just it. don't do anything about it mm-hmm. yeah that's exactly right and and the 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 da's don't do anything about it the da's could also get involved sheriffs could get involved yep um you know we have sheriffs that just tolerate this stuff in my county that's in texas where i used to live was definitely not the case the sheriff would not allow it and it just shut it down but here here's the danger there everything has pluses and minuses right the world's not you know a black and white um the danger of children's rights is what we see in the family courts today, where uh, unfortunately we live in a decadent society. That's and true. I mean that in the Latin sense, right. decadenced, mm-hmm. out of step with one another. Mm-hmm. There's no general agreement w- on what constitutes what's you know good for a child in many circumstances. Um, so it, the, the, the notion of children's rights could be used in such a way as to force parents in California to transition their children. It is actually being used that way. Well, properly defining rights is important. It's very much Mm -hmm. like the Incredibles. If everything is a right, nothing is a right. You do have to properly define what children's rights are. And and you want to give the widest scope to parenting, Mm -hmm. right? Because we recognize that geographical and cultural Mm -hmm. conditions, even in America, are not identical. Even just personality differences with kids. Yeah, you literally couldn't. Well, yeah, like my two sons, you know, did I ever tell you the story about how I figured out their personality differences? No, but I want to hear it because I love this kind of thing. So I was, I was, um, I couldn't understand modern cartoons. Like I just don't even get them. I can't even follow the plot. Mm -hmm. So I got the old Johnny Quest cartoons, you know, because like they have real guns and people don't get up when you shoot them and stuff, (laughs) you know? And uh, so we were watching the Invisible Monster, which I guess is one of the more popular ones for the cartoon aficionados. And uh, James was saying... You know, look at that monster. He's huge. He's going to outrun Bandit. And Bandit, you know, Bandit can't get away, but Johnny's going to try, you know. And Jude was going, Bandit's scared. You know, that monster, why is that monster so angry? So I just realized, it just hit me, like Jude was living the inner life of these characters mm. and James was living the outer life. And I, at, at that moment, I raised them completely different ways. Yeah. 
my way of motivating them and disciplining them was never the same after that. Well, this is why God did not say, do this with every single kid. God gave every kid a mother and a father who studies them, knows them, and is ultimately invested in them and can tailor make their parenting approach based Mm -hmm. on what the child Mm -hmm. needs. Here's here's the test. When they're old enough, you yeah. have them play Fallout Three, yes, or, or maybe maybe Skyrim. You're not going to give me I need a bingo four. card. Like, how many times are we going to get to like the video game references? But, but this, no, it's because he's not uh, going to give me Fallout Four. In in not Fallout Four, uh, I, <laughs> but because the 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 reason I bring these games up okay. is that uh, in these games you are you have a list of abilities that your character can improve right. upon every time you level up. Right. When I first played Fallout Three, I, I was introduced to it from a friend who was a Marine. Okay. His character was all about strength and big guns. Right. And I would watch him go into, you know, the bad guy area and he would have a mini gun and just run and go, just mow everyone down. Right. And then I was like, this game looks crazy. Like, I I don't know if I want to play it. You know, it's not really, he's like, well, just try it. I'm going to work. I played it. My character was a sniper who snuck around and had lock picking and computer hacking. And so. You play like I do. Yeah. When I, so my, my, my view of the game was I don't want any conflict. Anything that would be conflict, I will win before it occurs hmm. and I will avoid it. Yeah. And my buddy, who's quite literally like the hoorah mindset, built a character around charging in head first and using pure strength to, to shut down the conflict. And yeah. I, I thought that was really interesting to see yeah. because I knew that between our personalities, sure, mm-hmm. that mine was more strategic and, and staying back and his right. was more head on. You could see the personalities of the individual in how they choose their character to be. So it doesn't literally need to be a video game like Fallout. No, no, I, I've i even seen it in my own sons with like board games. So Jude never loses board games ever. Mm. Like he beats me and everybody else all the time. And the reason is very simple. He, my, my son James uh, and Jude, they, they learned how to play chess like before first grade. And good dad. And they were, uh, James could do, solve like three move problems. You wow. know, Jude, Jude could solve like one move problems, mm-hmm. but Jude doesn't play the rules. Jude Play plays his, he plays the person <laughs> and he's like, oh, uh, 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 he's very comfortable in these kinds of positions. And he would put you in positions where you were uncomfortable and beat the crap out of you. You got to teach him, him poker, Good right? Him. He plays Monopoly the same way. He's like, I know dad always goes for the expensive properties, right? <laughs> so I'm going to lay traps for him by buying properties in little areas where, because Jude, Jude actually found out the dice probabilities and back said, okay, where, if he wants to land on those spots where would he be likely to be able to land on the move before that good for him and then, good for like, him you know he plays the person that's clever right whereas and that's i think that's why james uh had trouble with jude as a box i mean james is more athletic than jude but jude would play with james's psychology mm. and get him into positions where jude could whack him in I boxing you know so this is really important so be so we, we grant that uh parents need this latitude right mm-hmm. Um, so I think absent abuse and neglect, which are really just two spectrums of the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Abuse and neglect, absent abuse and neglect. What we should be talking about is parental rights. Once you clearly define, uh, what abuse and neglect is, right? I I mean, so it's, there's no general agreement in our society. It's one of the problems that we have, right? And that's what I'm going to do. California. I'm going to tell everybody what children's rights are. California has a totally different idea of what child abuse is than yes, Texas. Yes, they're wrong, example. and they need to adopt my definition. So uh, I agree. Thanks. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't know if this is too hard of a segue. I'm moving there. I'll help you. But one thing we've discussed quite a bit on Timcast IRL is abortion. Mm-hmm. Colorado has no limit. Mm-hmm. Oklahoma has a, mm-hmm. a pure ban. Mm-hmm. How can we, as a as a as a country, function when the view of human rights is spattered and different across all the different states right nope. T- typically we have nope. a general view of your rights we have the constitution at the federal level which mm-hmm. supersedes it's the it's the, it, uh, all the states it's the law of the land but now we're running into this issue where the argument from the political left is it doesn't matter if you're you've just had nine months and can survive on your own if you are in the womb you have no rights at all mm-hmm. and can be terminated if the woman des- desires and then you have other states that say like Actually, from the point of conception, you are a human with human rights. I mean, th- this is this is a bifurcation in the, in, the, in the view of rights. I don't know how we navigate. So ultimately, all the culture war issues that we're coming up with today have at their root the same question, and that is, what does it mean to be human? Yes. Okay. These are ultimately philosophical questions. Yes. And hey, I'm going to look at the camera for the first time. Hey, Christian theologian, you need to get to work on this. Because we need a robust defense of the human person because we cannot fight back made in 
in Canada, like medical assistance in dying. We're Ooh. not going to be able to talk about um, proper understanding of children's rights to their mother and father. We're not going to be able to look at reproductive technologies the way we should, mm -hmm. transhumanism, pornography, the redefinition of marriage, transing the kids. Every single thing that we are talking about today comes down to the question, what does it mean to be human? Christian theologian, you are the only person with a worldview who is able to answer that. You're the only person with the scaffolding to be able to give a human dignifying response to that. So that is what we need. That is the urgency here, okay? And the problem with abortion, um, well, there's so many problems with abortion, but I will say no that <laughs> the reason why we have children being manufactured through big fertility, using somebody else's sperm, somebody else's egg, somebody else's womb, is because we have said children exist for us. We don't exist for them. And that began with abortion. That actually probably began with birth control. Yeah. I'm going to control this situation. They only come if I welcome them and if I decide. Instead of saying, you know what? Sex leads to parenting. If I have sex, I am consenting to welcoming a child into my life. So we have always been controlling reproduction. Birth control was the first step. Abortion is the second step. We've now taken that into reproductive technologies. I, I, I think I have a cultural solution for you, Jeff. Okay. Instead of surrogacy or changing all the laws, the mm. men out there who are trying to find... A, 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 a life partner and a wife mm -hmm. just need to go to meetings that Katie set up for her nonprofit. And then you'll meet women who are going to oh, be okay. as passionate about. I have thought about setting up a matchmaking service because I know so many good men and women who are like, I can't find the people that I want. Um, but I'm like, I don't know. Well, um, sadly, you know, um, and, and again, the Greek Orthodox church also looked into this in, in the, all of the ortho, all of the Orthodox churches in America. The divorce rates in and out of the churches are no different than the wider society, uh, except for That's some- That's not necessarily so, true. It, it's not necessarily true, but it's it's uh, nothing in statistics is necessarily true. Well, right? what's true is how you identify, but when you actually but, look at church attendance, regular mm -hmm, church attendance, mm -hmm, yeah. that is the lowest <clears throat> divorce rate. Well, it's 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 not in evangelical churches. Actually, the lowest is in communities like the Amish, the Beachy Amish, the Mennonites, mm -hmm. People who have essentially withdrawn from this society. Yeah. Secular society is what causes this. And they right? have the best food. Nancy and, Nancy Piercy did write about and, this in her War on Manhood, and she's mm -hmm. got the she's got the receipts for the fact yep. that evangelical not evangelical, men who attend church mm. regularly with their families have the lowest rates of ab um, abuse and the lowest rates of divorce. They are the most highly invested and they have the happiest wives. That's true. If the father attends. That, that's, that's right. That's yes, true. that's right. And that's I right. and I think but Oh, I just wanted to address her issues about human anthropology because it is actually the central question of our time. Yeah. And, um, but I want to point out a difference between where I as an Orthodox versus uh, a Protestant might think about what a theologian is. For the Orthodox, a theologian is not a philosopher. I think it's something that Protestants actually inherited from Roman Catholics. Perhaps. Where theology, you know, I went to a Roman Catholic university. You know, I didn't go to university when I was 35, but I went to a Roman Catholic university and if you if you went to one of the theology professors, said, let's go do some theology, they would take you to a library and they would apply philosophical categories to religion. Orthodox uh, theologians are just means one who prays, mm. people who pray a lot, monks, saints. Those are who we consider theologians, not people who apply philosophical categories to religion. But the problem the problem of our time is a philosophical redefinition of the human person. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and it's something I call expressive individualism, right? Do you call it that, or does Carl Truman call it that? Truman calls it that, okay. but but that predates him. It actually predates him. You're um, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and this this concept uh, is deeper even than I think Truman talks about, mm. where he kind of gives a genealogy of how this idea came about, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it actually goes back actually much further. You you said you know uh, this idea of abortion. Uh, happened with birth control, perhaps, or, or so the forth. idea that you can control children and when they come to be began with. Uh, birth Actually, control. you can go back to the Roman Empire and see this stuff, right? They through like exposure, it, that kind it, of thing, and, and they they even had uh, forms of abortion prior to birth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is not. I mean, this it's actually a pagan worldview. Mm -hmm. There, there was a, it, it was the advent of Christianity brought the idea that the individual has dignity. Yeah, and that's that, one thing Truman and, doesn't address. And created address. the category of child. Yeah. as yes, yeah. you're right. That's one thing Truman actually doesn't address. Yeah, and and so uh, one of the things that I pointed out to a lot of Christians who are trying to get their head around the California mentality is with this expressive individualism, and now I'm using it as Truman uses it. Um, you know, your identity is your sexual identity. Mm -hmm. Right. It is your sexual identity. So when they see children who don't have sexual identities, 
They actually think they're helping kids by giving them a social identity That's a good by sexualizing children. That's a very good way to put it. So it really is a fundamental uh, philosophical difference about what a human being is. I'll yes. tell you an anecdotal story because I think examples persuade more than, than arguments. Um, I had an NBC producer during my trial who was trying to get me one-on-one. -on -one. I think he was secretly recording me, actually. He finally mm -hmm. got me one-on-one. -on -one. And um, he said, well, Jeff, um, you know, you're going to church on Sunday? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to church. And this is on a Saturday night. And he said, can I come to church with you? And I'm like, yeah, man, come to church. You know, I'll pick you up. Uh, you know, we start at nine o'clock. I got, well, I said, it's an Orthodox service. So I warn you, you're going to be standing up for two hours. So he's like, yeah, but I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sure, sure he was recording me. And I said, okay, well, the first half of the service is for people who are outside the, the, the church. We call it the liturgy of the catechumens. And that whole first half of the service, the first hour is for you. Hmm. Said, my advice is don't be gay until we get to church. And try not to be gay until we leave church. Just fast from being gay. I'm fasting from being heterosexual. I don't do any heterosexual sex prior to going in. So you don't be gay until you get in and we'll pray for you. And then he said to me, and this was the this is when you know I realized what was going on. He said, but then I couldn't be who I really am. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's it. You think you're a biological computer, largely programmed to satisfy unconscious desires. I think you're something much more important that should be accorded more dignity than that. And you should be come to church and find out why that's the case. Mm -hmm. And he literally started crying. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the fundamental problem is we don't agree on what a person is. That's right. I, I There's no general agreement in our society anymore about this. Yeah. Even in we, the law, there's no agreement. I, uh, now, well, I just want to, I differ with you a little bit on how to deal with it politically. Because, it, you know, America has historically solved its problems by partition, Europe by expulsion. Mm -hmm. And and you know I I I th I think what you'll end up with is bleeding Kansas, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you if you have a fractured view of human mm -hmm. rights, yeah. you end up in a certain amount of time with you know uh, uh, this is eighteen what is it eighteen um, uh, forty four was mm -hmm. it yeah bleeding Kansas yes this is the, when when uh, we're admitting a new state there was two factions. Parent factions, many different factions. This before Texas, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and the, and the idea was we cannot allow the concept of slavery to to be allowed to take mm -hmm. foot in Kansas. Yeah, in the new territory, yep. Right, and, that, and many new what, territories. That was what it was about. That's what the Lincoln-Douglas debates were about. And this resulted in people going around killing each other. Yep, and, and you saw Lincoln's arguments, if you recall, were purely legal. Yeah. He just said, for us, it comes down to, does a black man have the status of a hog? Even the slavers didn't believe that. And so there's no intermediate status in US law. So they have full rights yep. as citizens. Um, but, but here's the but here's the thing. Um the the war was occasioned by the the desire to impose that on the South, even though probably the institution would have gone away in ten years anyway. But it, but either way, what I'm saying is that led to that's what led to the violence. I said, and my, my assumption was, if you want peace, if you want a peaceful union, you're going to have to realize people in New York are not going to live the kind of lives that they live in Dallas, Texas. Right. They're just not. Mm -hmm. But so I think it's important to say, you know, everyone always says like, what was the cause of the civil war? And, oh yeah, there's not a cause. No. Cause. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and the- I agree with you. The yeah. argument is the cause for the political conflict mm -hmm. was rooted in economics, predominantly around slavery, which led to a lot of debate, mm -hmm. a lot of anger. Well, Come on now, the, the northern industrialists were very upset at the fact that the southerners enacted tariffs and right. hurt their industries. But uh, I, I just mean, uh, there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of different issues yeah. Yeah. that economically emerge yeah. and everyone's going to try and pinpoint what the infl what, what was the inflection point that led to yeah. this. And, uh, uh, you know, I've read quite a bit about it. Some, some, many have argued, I think mostly from the southern, the Confederate perspective, it's that when Lincoln cons called for conscription to go and quell the rebellion or whatever, that was what made everyone want to fight. And I'm like, well, the states were already seceding. They were already seceding, yeah. But, but secession is, I think, the natural conclusion of the, 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 the ultimate federalist argument of the states can do their own thing. Mm -hmm. Why would they not, why would Texas not then say, we will not pay taxes to a federal system that allows the execution of human beings who are mm -hmm. innocent, in which case, yeah. Texas then says we, are, we, we will. Radical federalism uh, never uh, uh, contemplated that the federal government would take from one state and give to another. It's, um, it's not even so much that. I mean, if yeah. you look at uh, 
what happened in 2020 with Texas v. Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. The argument Texas had was Pennsylvania, as mm -hmm. well as many other states, yeah. were holding their elections outside of the Constitution and yep. thus it was impacting their participation yes. in the union. Yes. Mm. And the Supreme Court told them to screw off. Yes. I, my fear is that if we, if we try, to, try to take the approach of let Colorado just determine that mm -hmm. a baby at nine months, the baby is crowning. Doesn't matter. State says they you can, can kill, it. kill it on the spot. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm like- If it's got a toe in the womb. I mean, that's, that's just absolutely insane. It is insane. And eventually what happens is states like uh, 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 Oklahoma say, we will not participate in federal requests, requirements, taxes, laws, mm -hmm. or otherwise, because you are an, uh, you know, which, a, which a I must slave point out is exactly what California did with its transgender kidnapping law. Mm -hmm. It said that it would never return my son to Texas, even on court order. It would never obey a subpoena from a Texas court about my son. It would, it would never uh, uh, allow any public servant to give me any information about my son, including the schools. That's nuts. That is, that's, that is already happening. But I'm just saying, if you want a, if you want peace, if you want peace and you want to maintain the union, you're just going to have, we're all going to have to accept that we won't have what, the same ways of life. I'm, I just. Now you can I, say I, that's I, unlikely. I, I, no, I agree, but there's limitations. It has limitations. Uh, we, I, I don't see how we can have a constitution which mm -hmm. okay. seeks to protect the rights, the God-given rights of, yes. of its, its citizenry. Yes. And of all people, even people who are not citizens mm -hmm. have. These I rights, agree. because the Constitution does, does not grant them. This is what a lot of people don't understand, too. Yeah. They'll say, you know, for illegal immigrants or whatever don't have these rights. They're like, no, 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 the rights yeah, came do. from God. Right? Yeah, they have the same and, well, rights. And let me tie this back, if you don't mind, uh, between slavery and the current discussion. Um, you know, we, and I think, I think that you're, I think that you are right that we might have, like, like we had free states and slave states, where we'll have life states and death states. We do already. Right, we do already. Um, but it's so interesting to me because uh, reproductive technologies are actually feeding into this. So when Virginia passed its commercial surrogacy bill in 2019, for the very first time since slavery, they deemed a class of people property. Yeah. And that was embryos, right? Reproductive technologies have allowed us to commodify people in a way that we have not done since we had an industry and economy built on the backs of people that were deemed less than human. And so I just think like when you are starting to create technologies that parallel slavery in terms of the laws that we have to use to govern it, you really need to start taking a look at, are we heading in the wrong direction technologically? You're not going to stop it though. <clears throat> there's yeah. no, there's no evidence that these technological movements have ever been stopped. Like ever on any, it, 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 on it, anything. It, it, it can't be. It can't be stopped. And yeah. in, into the question of AI right now. I'm, yeah. I'm going to stop it. Not yeah. to deviate too far from the conversation, but just to mention AI, we've mm -hmm. got numerous prominent high profile individuals saying AI will be our end. Mm -hmm. And then people saying, why don't you stop doing it? They say, you can't because if I don't, someone else is already working on it. Too many people are building a machine they know will destroy us and they won't stop. No, people will kill their children. You cannot stop abortion from happening, mm -hmm. but you can take legal steps to yes. massively limit it. And that's what I'm going to do for all third party I, reproduction. I got I got to tell you, I mean, the reason I bring up, you know, Colorado, Oklahoma and this and mm -hmm. this conflict is that there is with I, I, I am horrified, infuriated and angered at the thought when I when I saw that video out of Virginia. Yep. Or that, uh, uh, I think she was a state senator or a rep or something, was talking to a judge and he asked her, like, clarify for me the I limitations. The baby is yeah. crowning right. and, and you can abort it. And she goes, there are no limitations. Mm -hmm. And the response from Governor Northam, which I think cost him uh, mm -hmm. severely, mm -hmm. was, well, you know, in these situations, the baby would be delivered. It would be resuscitated. Make it comfortable. Make it comfortable. As bring it, it to another room and then have Let, a discussion that's about right. it. I'm like, there is a, there is a, a, what a chilling phrase, make it comfortable. But you know what? I'm just- That is, he is being logically consistent. Yes, he is. That is the logically consistent position. There, it cannot be disposable like 20 hours before and then post, uh, no, dignity, full human rights. No, the the idea that infanticide should be able mm -hmm. to take place post-birth is consistent with an abortion mindset. That's but, the consistent position. So so I've, I've presented this argument to many uh, left-leaning individuals. I love how they say they're pro-choice. I'm like, no, no, you're pro-abortion. You're pro-abortion. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I, me personally, I have the traditional pro-choice position, which still seeks to balance. It, it seeks to balance the rights of the mother mm -hmm. and the child mm -hmm. and find that, that mm -hmm. it's, it's really, really difficult, if not impossible, but we're trying as hard as we can. Mm -hmm. They just say, I've asked them this. You have two women. They both, they're identical twins. And they conceived with identical twin brothers. At the exact same time, mm. the babies, eight months on, one baby 
is prematurely being born. It is born. The women are sitting next to each other. Can the doctor come in and kill the baby that was just born? Right. And they all say, well, no, that's killing a baby. I say, okay, the baby of the identical genetics and gestation in the womb, can the doctor kill it? Yes, it's the woman's choice. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why not just deliver it mm -hmm. and let it live? Mm -hmm. They don't care. They just say, it's the woman's choice. She can kill it if she wants. That is a moral line that I feel is absolutely untenable. I reject it outright. Mm -hmm. I do not feel that we are a sound society that federal, I, I, it's, a, it's a shocking proposition. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a psychotic proposition. And yep. Well, so it, that is why it you're, makes me scared. That's why you're a conservative, because <laughs> I mean, well, like conservatism yeah, but, but, is just living I'm, in reality. I'm, and the thing right. about progressives is their feelings are their God. Their self is their God. Their own well, sexual identity is their God. Because feelings and identity can change, their priorities can change depending I, on I, what the situation is. And so they are going to be logically inconsistent right. because they are not anchored to an ultimate reality. No, I, I, I think it's deeper and worse than that. Um, again, worse. Re yes, relying on Truman's analysis of expressive individualism. Um, it's not so much that it's just feelings. They have, you know, firm beliefs and actually their system is consistent. I it's internally consistent. It's not consistent with observed facts. But it's inter <laughs> right, 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 it's right. internally consistent. It's what philosophers call coherentism, right? It doesn't actually meet reality in a consistent way, but internally it's all consistent, right? Okay, and that's I why, agree with that. That's why it's often, actually often hard to argue with leftists. That's why I don't waste my time making arguments. I use examples from facts because mm. that's where the problem with their point of view li actually lies. Well, we, so so they believe uh, really that you know um, identity is something that that is constructed. Yeah, this yep. is wrong. And this constructed identity, it's it's actually a duty of people to construct their identity, mm -hmm. and within that kind of mindset, it's totally incompatible. And I don't even call myself a conservative anymore because I actually don't think we live under the Constitution anymore. I think it's, I don't, that probably happened about around FDR's time. Hmm. The government is not constrained by the Constitution in any way. I I, 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 I would love I to restore it. I would love to restore it and I would love to, to <coughs> be the case. Um, so I call myself a right winger now. You know, I just have a, a right wing perspective on things because I don't know what I would conserve at this <coughs> point. Hmm. Um, um you know, and I and I, I guess I could go into reactionary politics, which is I think is what you're about, trying to reestablish a kind of lost social order, hmm. and I respect that. Um, those reactionary movements have no history of success in the past. I I, uh, I actually disagree. I think the left yeah. is reactionary. Okay. Uh, if you look at Derek Bell, one of the yeah, uh, yeah, I know. forefathers of critical race theory, yeah, yeah, he he regrets the end of segregation. He wants it back. There. So uh, actually, if you look to the history of the world, mm -hmm. the the classically liberal framework that we have today in terms mm. of individual rights is new mm -hmm. and has only been around for a very, very, very short amount of You're time. Right. And these people want to restore what once was. You, you look at the eugenicists of the early 1900s yes. and you look at the critical race theorists yes. and they're arguing for a return to a segregated separate society where we can go back to the way things used to be. Hmm. Yeah, I don't I disagree reject with this. I say no. And what, what, what they'll do is the Alinsky tactic of accuse your opponent mm -hmm. that is uh, you know what you are doing. Yes. No, in fact, you mentioned an ancient, uh, was it ancient Rome or mm -hmm. where the babies are, the, the corpses? Yeah. Oh, yes, it's, it's been, it's been the, the, the way of the world to sacrifice children on the altar. Yeah. We put a stop to that. That's and it's right. only in recent history we have taken the strong well, moral positions. I want to point out, though, because I'm an opponent of all forms of liberalism, including classical liberalism, neoliberalism, uh, left liberalism. I'm even opposed to free market liberalism. I'm opposed no. to all forms of liberalism. I'm very unusual. You probably won't meet many people like me, but like I, I, all of that stuff about human dignity and all that stuff about ending infanticide happened before the Enlightenment. Okay, mm. it happened with the conversion of Europe to Christianity. Mm. Prior to the Enlightenment, under regimes today we would consider un intolerably authoritarian. Mm. Yeah, right. Which is why I consider myself a right winger. Like I would be Hamiltonian if I were. If I were back at the Continental Congress, I would be like Hamilton. I would want an elected monarch who could take long-term vision, these kinds of things. But uh, I'm more comfortable with that. But I, I just, do we, re are, is the government constrained by the Constitution in any way? It is. How? Uh, if you look at, I love bringing this, this up. We've talked okay. about it. Uh, yeah, lot, gun yeah. rights. I know it's your thing. It's your thing. Yeah, gun rights. Yeah. Huge. And um, actually free speech has expanded. We used to have obscenity laws. Mm -hmm. And now people mm -hmm. can uh, uh, speak By the way, more freely. we should give credit to our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters who maintained the anti-porn and the Hollywood production code all the way to 1959. Wow. Uh, until it was finally overturned. And then we got the explosion of pornography. But 
Thank you, Roman Catholics, even though I'm not Roman Catholic, but they did the hard work there. But uh, the question is, I suppose, is the government constrained enough? No. Is it constrained? Yeah. And, and we can make an argument as to how constrained it is, mm -hmm. but it is. I mean, you look at uh, what happened in New Mexico. The governor says, I hereby decree no guns. Yes. And across the board, everyone said, you can't do that. Right. And, yeah. and so the Constitution is simply a, a, an artifact of our minds. <laughs> let, let me give you an example of why I don't think it's constrained. So uh, Title VII, we had the Title VII case, right, where in the 1960s, they banned discrimination on the basis of sex. The Supreme Court just redefined the word to include, to include transgenderism. That's right. Which was never intended or right. meant by the people in the night. They didn't include crossdressers in the word sex back then, right? right. <clears throat> when, and, and this ability of the court to do that very thing happened it was it was not it's not granted to it in the constitution it's only allowed to decide in particular cases yes not to determine what you know not to impose a view of the constitution on the other branches of government but that was arrogated by the court in the very first court case marbury v madison like the constitution didn't su survive contact with reality in the very first court case so when, when you have a, a an institution that can simply redefine any term to achieve any social outcome it wants how is it limited how about the agencies Right, we're supposed to have separations of powers, right? So look at the IRS. So we have IRS special agents. Special agent, a special agent just means they can carry a gun, right? You have IRS special agents that can charge you with a crime. They charge you with a crime not under laws, but under regulations written by the IRS. You're, and, de you're denied a jury trial, and you'll be tried by an IRS judge. They have all three and powers of the branches of government. They force you to uh, uh, testify against yourself. That's correct. Every and people really need to get this. Libertarians are right. If you do not provide evidence against yourself to the mm -hmm. government as to your income every year, yes. they will come and they'll they'll shoot your dog. They will they'll lock you up. 100%. But my point is, we're governed by agencies these days. I don't even think elected officials even control it. I mean, Trump ordered the military out of Syria and they said no. Yep. But that doesn't So we so we know the president's not in control of the military. But I would say corruption of the systems is not an absolute statement that they are mm -hmm. there like so my my point is you yes. think there's still some remnant of, of limitation? Well, I think it's, I think if, if you go back in time to the First Amendment, mm -hmm. you could not, <clears throat> you couldn't carry signs saying certain things. People would not allow it. Yes. You, uh, uh, George Carlin famously got arrested for his, you know, seven words you can't say on TV. Well, originally the Bill of Rights applied, to, you know, these restrictions on government power applied to the federal government, not to the states. It was only later through the 14th Amendment that they were right. actually extended to the states, right? But I just mean that, um, I, I guess I'll just step back and say simply, there are instances where the government does what the Constitution prescribes and instances where it doesn't. Yeah. So you can make the argument that the Constitution is just like a, a, a smiley face sticker on the wall, and it's really just our morals that are deciding it. Yes. I, 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 so you're, you forced me to clarify my views. And even as I'm thinking about it, you've helped me helped me do that, actually. Thank you. Uh, so look, I think the, the Supreme Court, for example, looks out and says... You know that the temperament around abortion is getting to the point where it might lead to violence. So we need to outlaw it again, or at least yep. allow the states to control it. Like, I really think those are how the decisions are made. I agree. They're not made on whether the Constitution limits I believe that the re uh, if, if you were going to have an actual constitutional scholar, judge, and not a politician, when Texas sued Pennsylvania over the 2020 yeah. election, you had Thomas and Alito who said, it is our duty to hear this case. Mm -hmm. this, is how the, this is how our Constitution works. And the other judges were just like, nah. No, we don't need to. Uh, because it's not what, what is prescribed in the rules. It is what we as humans ultimately decide Correct. makes the most sense. Correct. There is a, per there, there is a balance that must exist in that, in that worldview. Yeah. For instance, I think judges should be good people and actually use their <laughs> judiciary ex uh, discretion yeah. to protect those who are more or less, uh, protect or punish those, depending yes. on if they're more or less deserving. If you have a man... And, and, they, and they mostly do, but not enough. There are too many instances where a judge goes, well, I don't think it's reasonable, but life in prison, you know, right. because you, you jaywalked or something. Right. I, I, I think we need to see more uh, discretion and leniency for those. And uh, uh, too many people are just thrown into the system and, and, and mistreated. Well, the, the, there, the thing is, and this, this goes back to um, some of the surrogacy issues that we talked about, because there are, there are massive um, government economic incentives to put people in prison. So let me give you an example. I, uh, I have this thing where I just, every once in a while I get so pissed off that I'll hire a lawyer for eight hours 
will go down to the Title IV D court in Dallas, Texas, where the child support court, Title IV D, it's called, they're actually called Title IV D courts. We have a statute in Texas. I have, I printed it out somewhere, um, which basically says the courts are, are, are always to rule so as to maximize Title IV D reimbursements. Yeah. It doesn't say in the child's best interest. Hmm. It's to reimburse Title IV D. <laughs> so they just have, right. they'll have black men lined up in the hallway going out to the street and they're just putting them in jail. All of them oh are just gosh. going to jail. So I'll just hire, sometimes I just get so pissed off about this that, you know, I just hire a lawyer and they, they he signs a contract for $1 with these guys and he just stands there all day and just represents these people and keeps them out of jail. <laughs> it just pisses me off. Good for you. Let me, let but me, here's let... the deal. They they go off the Title IV D reimbursement program and when they put them in jail, they go onto the prison reimbursement program, mm. which is $93 a day. So the government just looks at these people as, you know, fathers as just like economic transactions, mm. right? Yeah. So let, let me yeah. let me ask uh, your your perspectives on this stuff. If you were a judge, yeah, and you were presented with a court case mm -hmm. that, if you were to rule correctly based on the law of the land, the Constitution, and your duty, it would result in mass rioting and widespread violence. Would you choose to incorrectly rule for preserving peace? Okay, so didn't. Weren't there protesters, death threats, murder plots against some of the justices when the Dobbs decision was leaked? Yep, yep. Yeah, and they didn't bend. So I'm a little skeptical about this idea that everything is going to be done because of ideological persuasion. I mean, those justices ruled in that case, despite the fact that they didn't have a lot to gain personally or politically from it. Yeah. But but I, I, I yes, I, I'm just, I'm wondering uh, your moral position on, is it better to be correct for for as to the law of the land or is it better just to it's 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 sort of the you know to, to look at texas v pennsylvania mm -hmm. i'm sure the supreme court justices thought hey look if we take this case up texas is probably right yep the election is subverted yep. it goes to the house of Re de delegates there's going to be mass chaos they were writing in the boston globe mm -hmm. that the democrats would persuade western states to secede from the union in the event mm -hmm. of a trump victory mm -hmm. if trump yeah. didn't can yeah. concede some some demands of, of theirs. So I'm imagining that many of these justices were just like, the law doesn't matter. We should just do what minimizes harm. I'm wondering if if you think a move like that is the right thing or the wrong thing. Should the judges have been like Thomas and Alito saying, it doesn't matter what you think is right or it doesn't matter what happens tomorrow. It happens that we uphold our rules as they were as they are constructed and written for the preservation of the system. I believe judges are empowered only to rule in specific cases. That is all the Constitution allows them to do. And no, don't forget, the appellate courts are actually not part of the Supreme Court's you know, judicial branch. Those are Congress's courts. Yeah, Congress sets their appellate jurisdiction and everything else. In <clears throat> fact, Congress should use that. They should say you can't have environmental lawsuits for nuclear plants. They can just stop federal lawsuits on that. It's easy to do. Yeah, pipe dream. Yeah. But, uh, but so, so if you think about it, a judge only ruling in a specific case, he, can't, he, he must accept the riots. Yeah, I, I, I they must accept yeah, the, the law. Agree. The law is a teacher. The law is a teacher. It tells us something true about humans. It tells us something true about human behavior. You get the law wrong, you're going to get human behavior wrong. I mean, like I see that especially with the decriminalization of marijuana, for example, in our area. Like when I was a yep. kid and I was in you know high school in the 90s, there were a few people smoking a little bit of pot, definitely a lot of drinking, um, but generally like we weren't. We aren't doing that. We're like, well, pot, no, that's illegal. It's not It's not just illegal. It's hard to get, all of that. No, it just wasn't really a part of our world. Today, my kids will sit in the nurse's office with friends who are tripping out because they got bad hit or too much content. They're hallucinating, whatever it is. And my kids are some of the only kids around that are not doing any levels of pot. And the psychosis, you know, the lethargy, uh, the, the lack of interest in schoolwork, we taught kids something when we decriminalized marijuana. We taught them this is no big deal. And so it does matter what the law says. We do want laws that are grounded in natural law and what it means to be human, um, that has a proper understanding of human dignity and the rights of children. And then you need courage. I mean, probably courage is the thing that is lacking the most across society, probably with judges, but certainly with the ordinary man too. It is time for ordinary people with whatever position of power you have, or if you're just a mom and dad, it is time for courage. Nothing changes in this country without courage. Well, I, I have, um, this is why I call myself a right winger these days, and I don't call myself a conservative anymore. Um, I, I am not, um, and I'm going to use this word, but I'm not pointing to anybody here. I'm not naive enough to believe that uh, there can be a government that is a nation of laws and not of men. 
uh, governments are always of men. And the question is only the moral status of the men in authority, because that constitutes what the law will ultimately actually be, mm -hmm. regardless of what's written. Let me put it this way. If you have uh, an immoral man in power, it doesn't matter how good the laws are, he'll still use them against you. He will still use them against you. If you have terrible laws, but you have a, a moral man in power, he will never use them against you. The only thing that matters is the moral status of the people in authority. And that's what I think we don't talk about a lot. We pretend like the piece of paper laws constrain people from doing things, and they mm -hmm. don't. Only thing that constrains people is their conscience. Mm. Well, you can definitely see some of that with the two-tiered justice system yes. that's going on right now. But I wouldn't say that laws are inconsequential. I think that they do hem us in in some way still. They, they do, but they're, they're, the authorities think of them instrumentally. Mm -hmm. We don't think of them instrumentally. Mm -hmm. The laws are a tool for them to achieve their purposes, right? So we want to stop Trump from running. We can use the laws, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we want the Texas attorney general out because he's instituting a Pfizer investigation in Texas. We can use the laws. They think of the laws as tools, whereas we think of them as having some moral status. And I think we need to start thinking of the laws as tools and instrumentally the way they do. The question is, is the, is the uh, moral status of the authority someone that we can trust? And that's ultimately all it comes down to. So th in this sense, you can see that that's a very illiberal way of thinking about government. Mm. Um, but I actually think it's a more liberating and a freer way of living. For example, I do believe that people were freer under monarchies than they were un ever under democracies. And for this very simple reason. It depends on the monarchy. Are you talking about English common law? Are you talking about their tradition? Even under the French monarchy. Even under no, the Bourbons. No, 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 um, no. Not the French. I, I think so. I think no, a French king could walk in and take whatever little hamlet he wanted. But a yeah, British but, king could not because he, they had common law that well, almost no, he, predated he, the monarchy. The English kings actually did do that all the time. But look at the confiscation mm. of church property and you'll no, see no, that to, that's to, the to, case. Be, to be fair, though, I mean... Any system, no yeah. matter what system, the powerful people do whatever they want. You're right. What and I think Hans Hermann Hoppe, which into, which ironically is a you know a classical liberal libertarian uh, economist, um, has d done a pretty good analysis of this. Right. It, in democracies, you have to care what other people think and do because they vote and they can they can affect your life. In a monarchy, you don't really have to care what they think. They're not really affecting the laws that much, um, and so people socially are much freer under mon monarchies. And one of the reasons I think Christianity arose in the Roman Empire period, and it was more difficult during the Republic period, was precisely for that reason, right? It, you were just freer, you could just have a Christian religion. Nobody cared because you weren't going to influence the, the Roman monarch. You weren't going to influence him that much. Um, so there is, there, this is why I consider myself a right winger on these issues, right? The moral status of the authority is, what, is what's controlling, I think. Mm -hmm. I'd say if you want to dive into this, you should have your Rama Hazoni on your show because I think he is the absolute expert, mapped this out historically, looked at all the yeah. systems and understands common law and the British I agree tradition. with that. I've written a, a, written a pretty serious critique of his book. Let's. Well, uh, I, would, I would love to talk to him. Yeah. Let's, let's move on to envisioning the uh, dystopian nightmare that is before us. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing that terrifies me, AI, mm -hmm. uh, a year ago, I was making these goofy pictures of Nancy Pelosi using uh, stable diff diffusion, and they don't look like a human. They look like yeah. grotesque paintings. Yeah. Today, they look real. Yes. One year later, people have now begun to AI generate videos. Yes. And of of characters, we're we're getting to the point where we're a few years out. Last time I we were on, we did the voices. We 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 AI generated voices. That's of, right. You, you, you did Joe it. Rogan, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's and it's uh, some some voices are harder to do than others. Joe was. They couldn't was, do your voice, right? Yeah, it struggled yeah, with yeah, it, uh, yeah. me. It struggles with a few other people. It, it doesn't, you know, Luke, Seamus and I, it, it okay. didn't get very well. But for some reason, it just nails people like uh, Mitch McConnell or Joe Rogan. It, it, you know, but it, so it, well, they're large language models. So there's probably more correct. material to pull from right. for the people that are on the mic more often. Well, no, no, no. This this AI, you upload a 30 second audio file. OK. And then it will turn that it will it will take that sound. And then just you can, from that one clip. Yep. And then you it's can not an LLM, in other words. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, but um, I'm just I'm just making a general point about techno technological sure. advancement. The the big thing now that everyone's talking about artificial wombs, mm -hmm. and the I believe for the time being, let me pause. Through science, we can probably do anything within the confines of the physical world, right? Sure. Obviously, I don't think yeah. we're going to alter physics right. using technology. I don't think it's possible, but. Um, for the time being, the idea that a man, a biological male, could be given a womb and then give birth is 
Not possible. Mm -hmm. But there is a possibility in implanting a womb in a man and then having a C-section. And so this is what's actually one of the big debates now with womb transplants for uh, logical reasons, right? They're, they're, they, they start this because there are women who have damaged or injured their uterus mm -hmm. and receive a donor uterus mm -hmm. so that they can carry a child. Yes. And now the discussion is, okay, well, we did that for an obvious and logical reason to help someone who was injured. Mm -hmm. Now we can put a womb in anyone for any reason. Yes. Yeah. This and is how it, it always starts with a very sympathetic, understandable case. And it ends up with purchasing, mm -hmm. buying, selling, discarding, and shipping children. That's what it's going to end up at. And actually, I don't know if children will survive. So um, they have had some live births from uterus transplant from woman to woman. They've, they've had uh, about a dozen or so across the world yeah. um, where kids have been born to this. It's a very difficult surgery. The UK just announced a month ago that they did it for the first time successfully in women. Um, it was a sister donating to her sister or whatever, right? So it begins with this sympathetic case. And we don't yet have the technology to transplant a womb into a man. I, li I was talking to somebody yesterday who was like, I don't know. I don't know if you could survive. I mean, like, it's not just a bag. Like women's brains, their bodies, their hormone levels, right? All of that goes into sustaining a child. It's like it has to connect from something into something else. And those some things don't exist in men. So mm. really, it would just be a bag in a cavity that would be sitting there in the man. You would still have to create the baby in a laboratory, gestate them probably for a certain amount of time, and then transition yes. it to the bag. Yes, doing Yep. Transition it to the bag and then C-section it out because there's no exit. Their pelvis literally cannot support yep. an exit at that point. So I don't know if babies will be able to survive in a male transplant, but I actually think that that's not the greatest threat. I think artificial wombs are the the more likely scenario that is going to threaten children sooner um, because you do have, you know, the prototype that was developed. Uh, they had a lamb that was gestated, yeah. um, right, to virtual maturity. And lambs are somewhat similar gestationally to babies. It is intended to be a prototype. And of course, pro-lifers are like, well, this is awesome. Now if you have a premature baby, um, then you can transfer them to the bio bag and then gestate them until, you know, they are full term. Um, but the reality is that's, Maybe that'll happen occasionally, but what's really going to happen is when you talk about the baby assembly process, which requires sperm, egg, and womb, sperm is very easy to access, right? All those Japanese men that you were talking about last night, they could, they could give while they're at work, right? Eggs, female eggs are harder to access, but we've figured out a way to do it. If a woman pumps herself full of enough hormones and then you laparoscopically mm -hmm. extract them, mm -hmm. wombs are the hardest and most expensive part of the baby assembly process to procure. And that is why 25% of surrogates today that are renting their womb mm -hmm. are in Ukraine, right? Because these are economically desperate women that will rent their bodies out because their husband is at the front lines or he's been killed and they nice. have to support their three kids, right? This is why, why you've got countries across the world where brown bodies are giving birth to white babies because those brown wombs are cheaper than the white wombs here in the United States. And it would be so That's much true. easier for big fertility to just cut out the the female altogether in the womb process so there's a there's a movie that i just watched poorly executed by the way unfortunately okay uh you may have seen it. i forgot what it was called but it's about uh in the future they create pods mm -hmm. where you can put the baby in it and so career women yes. instead of actually having the baby they go to work and there's a closet where they put the baby the the, the fake womb in the closet and close sure. the door sure have you seen this no but there was that video that made the rounds late last year called like ecto life all those pods right all the pods I right and that. people are like is this real is it happening and the answer is no not yet but china is working on artificial womb technology and here's where AI, ai comes into the picture they are working on ai nannies robot nannies that are going to adjust the oxygen levels, the nutrition levels, they will be able to increase development or terminate development of the babies. Mm -hmm. And so this is really where the concern needs to be is right now, very often, if a child is created through a surrogate and defective, maybe there's too many of them, maybe there's a developmental disability, oftentimes the actual real life woman is the only one, even though she's not genetically related, standing in the way between life and death for that kid. And we saw this with the situation, Brittany, I forget her last name, but the woman that was pregnant with a surrogate's baby, the two men, right, who she found out at week 23 that she had an aggressive cancer and she needed to start treatment immediately. And the two men said, terminate that baby. And yeah. she said, but I, 
it's unlikely, but I could deliver the baby. The baby could survive. And they said, we don't want a premature baby with all the medical conditions. Yep. And she said, okay, I will find people to adopt the baby so the baby doesn't have to die. And they said, we don't want our genetics out there. Yeah. Kill the baby. And the baby is dead. The only they person- did They did kill it. They the did baby kill it. is wow. dead. She, she, was a, she was opaque about whether or not it was an abortion or a delivery. She won't say. But that baby is dead. I think we know. But yeah. I think that we know. So what I'm saying is, do you understand what happens when you cut out the woman in the gestation process? It will be unlimited, free for all. In terms of manufacturing, producing children. Oh, that's not even the half of it. That's Chris, not the half CRISPR of it. CRISPR technology? They're yes. gonna they're gonna they're, you're, you're gonna go to a designer baby factory so, right. as yep. a single person and be like, I'd like a child who's strong, tall, with that's perfect right. teeth. And then they're gonna give you a list of genetic options, be like, how how about this eye color? How about this eye color? So that's already happening. You can already choose eye color, hair color of your children. You Wait, already what how, where? The, because you can do genetic testing right at the moment that you conceive, you let the babies develop a little bit, and then you can test. And then you grade the embryos. You discard the you ones you don't want. Male females very easy. Actually. Very very wow. easily, right? And so what's going on right now? Female really, embryos weigh a little bit more. It's it's a eugenics process, and that's why when you're talking about IVF, whether surrogacy or not, only seven percent of babies created in a lab will be born alive. Mm -hmm. 7% because this is not about babies. This is about on-demand designer babies shipped worldwide. So here's the other problem with artificial wombs. And Jeff's told enough stories. I get to tell a story now. Yeah. Okay, so the story is I used to work for a Chinese adoption agency before I had kids. And I would accompany every now and then parents that were mm -hmm. going to adopt their children. And so on my very, very first trip there, I went to a Chinese orphanage a couple different times, same orphanage. And I speak Chinese and I had been translating the um, the medical reports and the schedules for these kids for a couple years. So I kind of thought that I knew how an orphanage ran. So I go into this room and it's probably a hundred kids. It was the three to six month room. Mm -hmm. And so it was all the babies, you know, two to three per mm -hmm. crib, head to toe, head to toe, swaddled yes. really tight. And I go in to this room of a hundred ch children, infants at that point, and nobody was crying. And I was like, wow, what an impressive orphanage. They've got these babies on the schedule. They're all sleeping at the That's same the time. Of swaddling. Yeah. This is amazing. Yeah. Right. But then as I started to sort of wander the rows, I looked and the babies were awake and they were looking around, but they weren't making any noise. So I was like, well, interesting. So I scooped one up and this is before I had children. Uh, but immediately there's something about women. You start to rock, you start mm -hmm. to sway. I, I suddenly was like, oh my gosh, I'm singing. I didn't even realize I had started singing, but <laughs> right. I'm singing to this baby. And you know, at first she was just listless, like not looking at all. But after a little while, what women do instinctively with babies is we look at them, they make a noise, we make the noise back, right? It's uh, We simplify our language to their level. That's instinctually kind of have women communicate with babies. And within like three or four minutes, her she was responding to me, like the eye contact, she was making facial expressions, right? She, she was lighting up, she was going, oh, babies at that age do this thing where they go, oh, oh, and you say, oh, oh, mm -hmm. back to them. And you literally teach them how to talk. And it was just the sweetest thing. So after five minutes, I went, I'm going to put the baby down. I'm going to pick up another baby. And I set the baby down and the baby lost it. Starts crying. Just loses it, <laughs> shrieking. And I grabbed that kid and I picked them up and I went, oh shit, these babies aren't crying because they've been trained to never cry. Wow. Right? It's not because they're on a schedule. It's because they have lost hope that anybody is ever going to respond to their cries. And so I held that baby for mm -hmm. two hours. I didn't pick up another baby because I couldn't handle the thought of putting that baby down and listening to her cry. So that is a level of human deprivation. So the only touch that those babies had was a bottle propped up in their mouth, uh, regular diaper changes. I mean, they were changed, they were clothed, mm -hmm. they were fed, they had a nail trim once a week, but nobody touched them, nobody looked at them, nobody made eye contact with mm -hmm. them. Now, I've adopted one of those children. You know, my son was in an institution until he was almost two. Mm -hmm. And the emotional short circuiting that takes place because they did not have human touch very often will um, make it difficult for them to function emotionally throughout the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Deprivation of human touch is a, a level of starvation, human starvation, that is, you know, cruel like we we punish people with solitary confinement Correct. Yeah. right because and it's considered one of the most cruel forms of punishment yes so that's what people happened to insane. those babies that's they right they do that's what happened to those babies now 
at least they had nine and a half months of touch mm -hmm. from their mother, enveloped in her smell, her mm -hmm. movement, her her dietary changes, right? The light and the dark of her the moving heartbeat. by a window, the sounds, her language, all of that. I actually don't know if babies in artificial wombs will survive. I don't know if they will, but See, if I, they do, they are going to be so horribly yeah. damaged. And you know, if, if your, your audience can Google uh, Romanian orphanage, orphanages yes. for what happens to children who are deprived of human contact yeah. up to age five. Yeah. And they're essentially, they have to be institu institutionalized. Yeah. They can't function. Yeah. It's well, there's awful. a, there, I, but, I, I, no, but, but I, I, I never underestimate the transhumanist globalist movement mm -hmm. to commodify human touch as well. I, yes. I, I think they'll uh, commodify everything. And right. I, and I want to point out because I, I like, I like to have a sense of proportion about things. Women have been, women's body, sexual body parts, for example, their breasts have been commodified throughout all of human history. Wet nurses, for example, mm -hmm. and rich women used to hire wet nurses so that their breasts could go back to normal size. And they would, and, and children became very close to their wet nurses, you know, and there's, there's whole books about in the South about it. It's very popular in the South, for example. But we've, we've rented out women's breasts for our, almost yeah. all of human history. We've right. done this. And their sexual organs, and now their eggs, and now their yes. womb. Every female yes. specific body part yes. is in demand. You are correct. Mm -hmm. Right. I think, uh, I think it's fairly obvious. And I, we're not stopping I'm, it. I'm, I don't I'm, think we're stopping it. I'm assuming everybody would agree with this that pregnant women get instructions from their babies. So to not, do certain things. Not just instructions, but there's actually a cell exchange between women and the children they're gestating. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of chimerism where their cells mm -hmm. literally meld into one. And they discovered this because they found male cells in women's brains. And they're mm -hmm. like, what yes. on earth? Yes. And it was from the male babies that right. they had carried. They become one. And so this is why, you know, this idea that, oh, she's not really the mother, right? She's just the oven for somebody mm -hmm. else's bun is a lie. Everything going on chemically between so the mother an and baby. there's epigenetic pathway as well. That's correct. But, but so, so the the you know the even the <clears throat> dietary choices of the mother. That's uh, right. Reflect in real genetic changes in the baby. So imagine um, we, we know that babies are releasing. There, there's chemicals released. Mm -hmm. There's hormones is exchanged. There's mm -hmm. blood exchange. So you know, w w uh, pregnant women having cravings for specific things. Mm -hmm. A lot of it obviously has to do with the pregnancy hormones and what the baby needs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Put a baby in an artificial womb. Yes. The baby sends out signals saying we require, no. you know, this particular vitamin or nutrient no. and the machine does nothing. Right. That's right. And not only that, but the woman is going to respond to the pathogens, the viruses in her world and start making antibodies for the baby. Like you but cannot again, I, replace the human I don't aspect that. of this. Uh, I think that, uh, that AI systems will, will be able to analyze, uh, uh, real pregnancies in real time, and they'll use similar to like generative AI methods. They'll try. They'll look at all of these variables or many of them, and uh, learn them and recreate them largely. And and and, you and know, remember, remember, for the people that are doing this, it's only it's only it needs to be good enough. It doesn't have to be like the, what we want. Right. For them, it only has to be good enough. Yeah, right? to get your child product and, so you don't have to in, quit your job or wreck, wreck your body. Yeah, and in fact, uh, you know, socially isolated people may be a desirable trait for some of these people that are doing this, right? So I, I think it's uh, very powerful people want this to happen. And the transhumanist agenda is real. And I don't think it's, it, it's not just about mind machine. It's not just about artificial births. It's a program to take control of human evolution, totally yep. control, mm -hmm. total mm -hmm. control of it. And, um, you know, I think one of the fears that Elon Musk has talked about, for example, about some of the threats from AI, he subtly hints at this as the major threat. It's well, the control of human evolution. And I think they're going to be able to do it. So it is absolutely happening. Like you have eugenics concerns already among kids created through these technologies. Yes. You know, we've got kids that are saying this is a eugenics process. I am, a, I am a product that was designed, conceived by two specific specifications. Every single step that we take away from children being created in the marital embrace mm -hmm. has only resulted in damage to kids. I mean, mm -hmm. even now with surrogacy, we already have cases where you've got like the baby factory dad in Japan, like a single guy, mm -hmm. Japanese guy who created dozens of children through surrogates in India and Cambodia and Thailand. Um, single guy, rich guy. Yes. He just m made all these genetic children, I believe, with a, the egg of a white woman. He's raising them, you know, in a big apartment. Yes. You already have kids. Here's the other thing about big fertility. You know, we talked last night about adoption mm -hmm. being a just society's response to children mm -hmm. who have lost their parents. In those situations, the child is the client. Adults have to go through all kinds of screenings and vettings yeah. and background checks, home <clears throat> studies. 
that is not how it works in big fertility. In big fertility, if you have the, if the bank can clear your check, you get the baby. So we already have situations of pedophiles mm -hmm. creating children yes. through surrogacy who would never have passed an adoption background check. Oh, that, right? That's true. This is baby buying and selling. And I will tell you, there might be a few nice couples that are like, this is the solution of my infertility, mm -hmm. but this is going to be, you want to talk about child exploitation and trafficking? Artificial wombs are going to give it to I you. I actually think it will always be far less than the abuses in the current system. What so the will current, be far less? I don't know. The, I mean, what well, will on. be far less? Let me, the, 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 so, the abuse of children is going be to be less far less with the advent the current, of- Than the current I system. I mean- and Here's why. Let me explain. The current system puts half of children without fathers with, with well-known effects. The, often, this is being done because the children are effectively being bought by welfare programs. So you cannot get welfare in many states if there's a father in the house, a father who's working in the right. house. So I agree with that. And women, women optimize uh, their, their highest payout per, relative to the cost at three children. So we're already buying children in the current system. We just don't talk about it like that, but that's exactly what we're doing. We're paying women to have children from three different fathers to maximize the payouts. Okay, so like based on like international mm -hmm. law, because mm -hmm. I was responsible for like yeah. compliance with adoption law, yeah. federal, state, and international, yeah. um, you purchase children by direct payments to the birth parents, mm -hmm. right, to relinquish their parental rights. Mm -hmm. That is by baby buying and selling. Mm -hmm. So that is prohibited in adoption. So I don't know yes. what you mean by the current system, but the current system of we adoption- We pay women to have children without fathers. That's what I mean, it's very simple. Well, that's not technically the definition of trafficking. What's happening in big fertility is I, technically the definition of trafficking. I'm not worried about legal definitions. What I'm worried about is the fact that uh -huh. we have an economic, we give money and have an economic incentive for women to have children without fathers. And it is the biggest social problem in America, far larger than surrogacy will ever be. It is if, the biggest problem in America. Fatherlessness is the biggest problem in America. When you're talking about the commodification of children and the danger to yeah. trafficking, surrogacy and artificial wombs are going to blow that away. Yes. So what what we it's will say- It's going to be too expensive. It'll never be I, as big I, as the current system. I, if, it, it's if, not going to be. Look, you're going to get cheaper and cheaper, just like high HD TVs. Right. Te the technology is going to advance rapidly. It, and if we get to the point, it, 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 cost is it not- literally co can't. Cost doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You're gonna you, you have you already have people who make a billion dollars. It's a, it's a massive industry trafficking. The, the and if the traffickers yep. can put an artificial womb mm -hmm. in the jungle, oh, of, artificial wombs you're talking about are surrogacy. No, no, no. I'm talking about artificial wombs. I'm talking about surrogacy. If we get to the yeah. point of artificial wombs, you will have these traffickers mm -hmm. growing human beings for the purpose of being sold. That's they right. won't exist mm -hmm. in any system. They won't That's be trackable. Right. No one will know they're missing. These 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 children will never learn. Yep. And then you know the worst part is. The traffickers will dispose of them That's right. when they when they are no longer a viable product. So yes. surrogacy is paving the way for that. Right now, with surrogate-born children, we don't know where they're going. Like in adoption, there's post-placement reports. Mm -hmm. There's there's follow-up. There's supervision. Mm -hmm. You have things like the Uniform Parentage Act that was passed in uh, Washington mm -hmm. State. By the way, it's coming to your state too. So if you're in touch with your state legislators, look for the overhaul of parenthood through this dystopic bills called Uniform Parentage Act. It simply means children are going to be awarded to whatever adults have the money and means to acquire them. Surrogacy is doing this. There is no tra there's no tracking of these kids. We don't know where they go. They are taken cross borders and they disappear forever and nobody is monitoring it. And they should. I completely agree that surrogacy should be tightly regulated like adoption. I agree with that. It should be banned. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it's, <laughs> it, should, it should be banned. I agree that it should be banned. This is the thing. But my thing is, under the current, Until then. when I compare it to the current system, it's better than the current system. It's not. It produces outcomes that are objectively better. They're not. Uh, well, I, I, the, I, I, I think the, 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 the single well, father home, the single father home, and the outcomes for people who can afford surrogacy are better than the single mother homes that exist in the current system. The solution to your boys no, no, losing a relationship no, no, no. with their father is not to have ch That's children lose a relationship with their That's mother. That's straw manning. That's not what I'm saying. I'm sa what I'm saying children is- Children have lost their father in the current situation. The solution is not to insist that children lose no a relationship with their mother. There is no solution. It's mitigation, first of all. But should we compare against an ideal that probably we can't attain given the reproductive technologies that are coming? Or should we look at, the, should, should particularly men, look at the current system and the risks in the current system and decide what to do to achieve the best outcome. The current system is is awful. Mm -hmm. The future proposed mitigation is awful. I, I agree with all that. But, I think but, it's. I, I, but, I, guess, but, I think. I think. I think you have to be. A, I, I. I propose that we not be uh, starry-eyed idealists, and instead, what we should do is be realists and try to achieve the best outcomes we can in the broken system that we have, 
as we, you and I, work together to mm -hmm. change that system. So I, I propose I think, that we recognize the realities of the child, that they come from a man and woman, get their biological identity from that ma man and mm -hmm. woman, are maximized with their development by that man and woman, are statistically the safest, most loved mm -hmm. in the home of that man and woman, and that all law, culture, and technology bend to the reality of the child instead of forcing kids to fit I the mold agree with of whatever's and, 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 and that is okay. the current system. Right, right. And I, I, so I, I, I think I just need to say it is, it is beautiful and laughably naive because the horrors of technological advancement are beyond your comprehension. They are, and, and, so, and they're right. nearly unstoppable. That's right. right. And so as, as we sit here today, I imagine it's gonna be like 30 years and they're gonna, someone's gonna pull up the archive and they're gonna be like, look how stupid they were. They had no idea what was coming. Know, That's and, right. there, and there's gonna be like the weirdest so, cloning. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be people no, no, who are half dog. This, this, yeah. is, this is the thing, like when I read the two most commonly read dystopias, right, that, that everyone reads in college, right? It's Brave New World in 1984. And Brave New World was far more accurate. I agree, yeah. Far more I, accurate. I, I, to be fair, Luke Rutkowski of We Are Change has a shirt, which is a a, a big chart of all of the dystopians, yes. and then in, overlapping in the middle, you are here. Yes. Yeah. Because there's elements of all of it. Yeah, You're right. right. From Fahrenheit 451, and, and Brave to, New World, 1984. I, I still would like to know what, what should young men do in this current system until it changes? Well, you cannot overhaul or forsake I, I, the ideal. That's the one thing. Like, there's no other uh, option for this. It is going to mean that men are going to be happier. I'm sorry, I, they're I, not. There, there is a a practical cultural behavioral solution. Mm -hmm. As we as we've already mentioned, the Amish seem to have done very very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are there are Amish families nearby here, yeah, and they've got, the they've got the best food. So they really do. I well, mean, they, they have fresh organic fresh farm food, mm -hmm. clean. Yeah. And uh, when we had. Uh, Fresh and fit they on the show. They don't vaccinate their cattle. Yeah. For, uh, fresh and fit. They do not. But, uh -huh. it, well, it's all just like organic, yeah. raw of the earth. But yeah. uh, fresh and fit's position was this is the reality of the world, so we must have men learn and adapt to it. And he, you know, they said, you know, look what these how these women behave, what their expectations are. You, you no matter no matter who the woman is you meet, she's on Instagram, and so there's going to be some famous guy or some guy with 300,000, 500,000 followers in the blue verification. Mm -hmm. It's going to send her a DM and it's going to be, oh, wow, look at this. You can move up. Yep. And I said, and the likelihood of that happening if you meet your wife at church that's is right. very low. So that's the other thing is like, I heard them. I know that that world exists. There also are other worlds that exist. There are, there's my world that exists. My world, where we've got people that are living by a shared set of values, raising our kids a certain way, to believe certain things, right? To recognize human dignity, to live according to that human dignity, to not define themselves based on their sexual it's, feelings. It's, it's like Water World. You ever see that movie? Yes, I do. Water World. You see Kevin what, what, Costner? Kevin Costner. I, I remember okay. the smokers, which was and, the funniest yeah, and, part and, of the movie. And so what we have are people who have just resigned themselves to mm -hmm. This, the world was, they said the world was created in a deluge. Right. Kevin Costner, because he was like a mutant or whatever, could go underwater and he knew that the world was destroyed by one. Right. But you had people seeking out dry land and it was a myth. They said dry land doesn't mm -hmm. exist, but they found it. And right. there are like horses running and there's right. flowers and right. food and right. trees. Right. And so my view is you can choose to sit on that boat and just float in the ocean and say, this is life and I'm, I'm, I'm resigned to it. Mm -hmm. Or you can seek out that dry land like they did in Waterworld mm -hmm. and they found it. My point in reality is, it may be very, very difficult, but I think there are a lot of uh, political, social arguments to be made about what we should do, where we're going, how it should be. But first and foremost, for the individual, what they can do is, yeah, you need to be away from these things. Yes. Like I was saying to Fresh and Fit, if you are concerned, male, man or woman, that you're going to mm -hmm. get a, a dopey guy who's going to leave you with the baby and run off, or you're a guy who's worried the wife is going to bring you to divorce court and take everything Which from you. Which statistically happens more often than not. It does. Mm -hmm. But- I would argue, move to a small town, very small, with responsible, hardworking people, seek it out, find it, and meet your uh, meet the people who are like-minded through community and who have uh, mm -hmm. social obligations. If you're going to church regularly, and I am not a Christian, uh, I do believe in God, but I know a lot of people might be like, I just don't feel right going to, you know, I don't believe. Find a place where there's community gathering and social expectation, and then you find a person who says, maybe in time we grow to not mm -hmm. get along, but we recognize our duties and responsibilities. So while we may not be having fun, we are being responsible. Find, you, you, you find someone who can recognize that maybe you're not going on date night anymore. Maybe you're not watching movies together. You actually don't like the sounds or smells or whatever, but you also recognize you have a responsibility to your kids and to your family, and you learn to work together, not for yourselves, but for the children you've okay, created. Okay, so all of this has to do with what does it mean to be human? Are right. you going to recognize mm. the biological realities that 
for example, men and women make babies. But I will also say, you know, fresh and fit, they were talking about their 50, 60 women that, mm-hmm. you know, the body count they need to get. Like, how many babies have you fathered? Yeah. How many babies have you fathered? Yeah, I know. That you do or do not know about? And you Ooh. think that that is the solution to this, right? You're talking about all these women and how, oh, well, they're they just so needy solution. and they're so lost because they didn't Mitigation, have dads. That's yeah. what you said. Yeah. Right. But they're, they're like, well, well, I don't want those women. They didn't grow up with fathers. So I'm like, you are creating the fatherless children. So like to me, they are living so inconsistently with the natural world and they're not going to be able to survive through that. So they think that they're adapting. They're not adapting. They're perpetuating. So I'm sorry, opt out, create a new culture, go to the place where people have a so, robust understanding of human dignity and live there, according to it. There, there is, um, you know, I do respect this kind of idealism um, and, and I agree with the ideal. Um, but, you know, I, I get this a lot from women. They'll say, uh, Jeff, you just chose poorly, you know, and, and the, a lot of women say, well, just choose better, choose a spouse better. Well, first of all, women fall for most divorces. They're the ones choosing poorly. Um, college educated women, it's like 90% uh, of the filers are women. They're choosing very poorly. That says something about our education system. Um, but I don't believe that choosing wisely can overcome the massive, uh, economic, uh, and social incentives that, that cause women to, or not cause, but incentivize women to divorce. It won't solve everything. Yeah. And, and, and so while I think, yeah, I, I, I admit it, I'm the one who brought it up. The Amish communities, and I think even the Mennonite communities that have withdrawn from society, can, you can have this. But, it but will, hold on, it won't scale. And, and, and it, if you want something that scales, that, that can help our wider society, you must change the incentives. You but understand I, what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I want to add though, I, I, they haven't withdrawn from society. I mean, no, I know, but but they've they created have, an alternative society. Th- that's but, what but, I mean. But but not even if you if you drive a minute down the road, you can go to a Mennonite farm oh, and yeah. walk in and hang out with them and play checkers. Yeah, I hang and out buy with food. them. In te- when I live in Texas, I hang. I used to hang it's, out with them. It's mm-hmm. it's it's just a a a community. That's mm-hmm. all it is. I mean, yeah. if if uh, if I start talking about yeah. skateboarding, yeah. I w- I will be speaking a foreign language to you guys, oh, yeah. describing all of these things. I know it's its own y- y- society, right? and and yeah. so they they have their social norms and expectations. Yeah. I I say while we're dealing with these these problems, you simply seek out those who hold those views and live in that community. Okay, so this has been a mandate for Christians since the Sermon on the Mount. That's what church means, right? That Ecclesia is literally what church, means those who are called out. That's exactly right, and that Jesus go. said. What do you need to do? You need to, you know, Christians talk about being in the world, but not of the world. We have been doing this for two millennia. When Jesus said, you need to seek the city on the hill, do you know what he's saying? He's saying there's a city within your city, right? My church, my church community is in Seattle, but we don't live like Seattle. We have a different set of laws that govern us. We use our body differently, our words differently, our money differently. We have different priorities. Mm-hmm. We raise our children differently. Mm-hmm. So we that is what church is. It is a parallel society within a city. And mm-hmm. that's actually the mandate for all Christians. So um, you do not have to be conformed to the culture. As, you know, Christ tells us you are not supposed to be conformed to the pattern of mm-hmm. this world. And fresh and fit are being conformed to the pattern of this world. We are supposed to be transformed by what? By the renewing of our mind. What we think first, the values that we have is going to dictate our behavior. So get out of the culture that is speaking a certain kind of values, get into the place that has higher values, higher laws, and and actually the authentic God. Find your women there. It's not going to perfect everything. We're fallen people, but that is where you're going well, to no, opt I'm into just, a system. Don't, don't, don't try to find your wife in Sodom or Gomorrah. Yes, <laughs> obviously not. Yeah. But what, well, <laughs> all I'm saying is that uh, large-scale economic and social incentives matter a lot. Yes, they do. And they probably matter more than anything else. Not more than anything else, well, but they in matter. The, in, the, in aggregate effects, they observably do. Yeah. Okay. Did you say social? Social and economic. Okay. Yeah. I agree with the social. I think the yeah. social is the most powerful. Oh, no. I, I think if you pay, look, we know if, if we pay women to have babies out of wedlock, they'll just yes. have babies out of wedlock like crazy. Even yes. even in very religious yeah. black churches. What you incentivize, you get more of. That's and right. And we've been incentivizing fatherless homes. And, and, and the incentive, time. the incentives for divorce are mainly for women to take sole control of the children. Yeah. That's what the evidence shows, right? And if, if, if as someone who has ardently tried to change these laws in several states. I can tell you there are entrenched interests that are going to prevent that. You're not going to change those incentives anytime soon. So the idea of, you know, go go be Amish, go be Mennonite, uh, find a church. It's pretty obvious that, that there are a lot of men that want to do this. Mm-hmm. They want to find wives like this. 
they can't find it in America. They're going to the Philippines yep. to do it, right? In order to find it, it's a way of kind of stepping out of society as well. But the vast majority of men are not going to do it and are not able to do it. So and we have to be real about this. We're just, a, it's just about that time. If, uh, if you want to offer some final thoughts, oh, sure. Jeff just spoke. So uh, Katie, if you want to just give your final thoughts. My final thoughts are, uh, you've got all kinds of challenges, adults. You're unwanted singleness, you're in a struggling marriage, you're post-divorce, you're dealing with infertility, you have same-sex attraction, you want to be parents. Um, you have a lot of struggles. Those struggles are very, very real. The solution is never to make a kid bend and sacrifice for you. Someone is going to do the hard thing in those situations. It needs to be you, the adult. You are the one that sacrifices. We don't make kids sacrifice for us. And I'm sorry, but this culture is telling you, you can do anything that you want and the kids are going to be fine. That is a lie. You are not allowed to harm the rights of your children, their right to life, their right to their mother and father, their right to be born free and not bought and sold. No, you adult have to sacrifice for children because the only alternative is for kids to sacrifice for you. And that is an injustice. So that's my pitch. Right on. Any final thoughts, Jeff? I, I think I'm a realist. I'm not an idealist. I think people should uh, look at the world as it really is, that uh, I've talked to young men who are actually doing this. I'm more describing a phenomena than advocating for it. If we don't fix the system of incentives that exist in the United States, in particularly around family law and the family, um, surrogacy will only grow. And I believe, and I, and I, I think it's a rational decision by men to protect themselves, even as it is an unfortunate one. So we should really focus our efforts on fixing this incentive system. Right on. This has been a blast. It was a really great conversation. I appreciate uh, both of you coming and hanging out. Thanks for daring to do it. Oh, yeah. And more it was a come. great conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's good and, to see you again. And, it's and, very good to see you. Yeah. Awesome. And now we're going to go. We're going to go hang out. So for everybody who's watching, thanks so much for hanging out. It's been a blast. You can become a member at TimCast.com. The next show will, uh, will be tonight at 8 p.m. YouTube.com slash TimCastIRL. And we'll see you all there.